It is odontogenic myxoma. Odontogenic myxoma. ठीक है? In odontogenic myxoma, we see a tennis racket appearance or a multilocular radiolucency, which is one of the hallmark of odontogenic myxoma. Is it clear? Should we go on to the next slide? Now for cherubism, now cherubism may there are certain questions have come in addition to bilateral multilocular radiolucencies. If you can see, there are certain certain oral manifestation which appear to be unique to cherubism. There is a genesis of the second and the third molars, and the second line is perhaps the most important. Cherubism represents the only condition in which there is anterior displacement of the teeth. By anterior displacement, I mean, supposingly these are the multilocular radiolucencies in the posterior mandible. The teeth will actually be pushed towards the symphysis menti or towards the anterior mandible. Cherubism represents the only condition in which the teeth are displaced anterior. Is it clear? Is it clear? Now. Now, by displacement of teeth, I mean generally anterior displacement. But in which condition is perhaps most of the odontogenic cysts in the tumor actually displace the teeth bilaterally. But cherubism pushes it anteriorly. In addition to it, we come across these findings like premature exfoliation of primary teeth and sometimes delayed eruption. But most of these findings are more of elementary stuff, not really very difficult stuff to conceptualize. Is it clear? Now, coming to fibrous dysplasia, now if you guys are wondering why I have served, all of a sudden come to fibrous dysplasia is the only reason because cherubism was previously called as familial fibrous dysplasia. Okay? Cherubism, uh, well the premature exfoliation of teeth, of the deciduous teeth generally occurs in cherubism and in addition to it, in addition to it, sometimes there is also a delayed eruption of the permanent teeth also. Okay? So these are the certain oral manifestation. Obviously, both the things will not happen in the same patient. So in some patients of cherubism, there will be premature exfoliation and in some other patients of cherubism, there will be delayed eruption of permanent. Now the reason why I came across fibrous dysplasia is because cherubism was previously called as familial fibrous dysplasia. Now, I have written a word called hematometers. Do you guys know what is a hematoma? Hematoma kya hota hai? What is a hematoma? Now basically, the difference between a tumor and a hematoma is a tumor is an organized growth of mass. No, that is a hematoma. Hematoma is a collection of blood. This is a hematoma. An extra R is there. Now in a hematoma, there is the basic difference is the tumor is organized and hematoma is disorganized growth of the corrective tissue. That is the only difference. The tumor is an organized growth, whereas in hematoma is disorganized growth. Okay? So, is it clear? Should I go on to the next part now? The difference between a tumor and a hematoma. Examples of hematoma. Can you guys give me an example of a hematoma? Hemangioma. Hemangioma, remember, is not a tumor. It is an hematoma. Basically, an example of a disorganized growth of the blood vessels is called as hemangioma. Okay? Similarly, disorganized growth of the fibrous tissue replacing normal bone is fibrous dysplasia. Okay? Now, fibrous dysplasia is basically, well, we all know this, monostrotic, polyostrotic, Now, uh, just a short slide to tell what exactly happens in fibrous dysplasia. Now, the reason why fibrous dysplasia becomes pretty important to you guys is fibrous dysplasia is pretty prevalent. In fact, in India, it's not common, but abroad, it's pretty common fibrous dysplasia. What actually happens in fibrous dysplasia? As you can see in the slides, the normal bone starts getting replaced by the cellular fibrous tissue. Okay? Why it happens? How it happens is still unknown. And we just have one word for this, idiopathic. None of us, nobody knows how this starts happening. But what they say is, there is some sort of mutation in a gene which results in the replacement of the normal bone 
by the cellular fibrous tissue. Okay. Now monostotic fibrous dysplasia. Well, all this is again elementary stuff. 80 to 85 percent of cases, male, female, somewhat similar decade. Sites may uh, may we have written it. Ribs, femur, tibia, maxilla. Now the word maxilla becomes important to us guys. The word maxilla really becomes important because of this. We have certain oral manifestations of fibrous dysplasia. By fibrous dysplasia, I mean monostotic fibrous dysplasia. Remember, in fibrous dysplasia, these are the oral medicine findings, which are not really important as compared to your radiological findings. Now, what are these radiological findings? These are the radiological findings. As you can see in the slide, any stage of fibro osseous lesion. These are the radiographic features of the fibrous dysplasia. Either monostotic or polyostotic really doesn't matter because it's the same stuff radiographically. Now every stage of fibrous dysplasia is divided into three stages. The first stage is complete radiolucency. The second stage is intermediate stage, and the last stage is it starts becoming fully radio opaque. Okay. The first stage is completely radiolucent. The second stage is intermediate, and the last stage is completely radio opaque appearing. We have these certain appearances which are the hallmark of fibrous dysplasia: ground glass appearance, frosted glass appearance, orange peel appearance. All these appearances are seen in fibrous dysplasia. In addition to these radiographic appearances, we come across some other radiographic findings also, like this. Lack of sharp marginal definition. Can you guys, in this particular OPG, tell me where is fibrous dysplasia? Is it left side anterior maxilla, right side anterior maxilla, right side posterior mandible, left side posterior mandible? Can you guys write it down? Can you see the OPG clearly? I think you can. So in this slide, what you can see is in which part of the entire OPG can you? Make out where there is fibrous dysplasia. <laughs> mandible left? No, it is not mandible left. Though there is a lesion, but that is a different lesion. In posterior mandible, can you see the cursor? This is not fibrous dysplasia. Okay, this is not fibrous dysplasia. This is rather enostosis. Do you guys know exostosis? Exostosis is bony outgrowth. In, huh? In exostosis, there is bony outgrowth, whereas in exostosis, there is ingrowth. In this condition, the uh, the fibrous dysplasia is actually in the anterior maxilla right side. Can you make out now? Just think. Just see the slide now carefully. Can you see the cursor? Anterior maxilla right side. You might be able to see certain radio opaque area. Just compare it. With the left side of maxilla, you can see the maxillary sinus very clearly in the left side, but in the right side, the maxillary sinus, no, not above the maxillary sinus, on the area of the maxillary sinus. Okay, you cannot see the cursor, so I'll just guide you in this. So in this case, just compare the maxilla, right side and the left side. Can you see this? Yes, the sinus cannot be seen in the right side of the maxilla, isn't it? Why we cannot see it? Because there is a bony outgrowth of fibrous dysplasia that has completely obliterated the maxillary sinus. So diagnosing fibrous dysplasia is pretty difficult simply because of the reason that it completely merges with the surrounding bone. Yeah, as you can see, lack of sharp marginal definition is the hallmark of is the hallmark of fibrous dysplasia. ठीक है, there is, can you see any root resorption in this? Can you make out any root resorption? No. Remember, in fibrous dysplasia, there is absolute root resorption. There is absolutely no root resorption. आपका तो displaced हो जाएगा, tooth will start getting displaced, but there will never ever be any kind of root resorption. ठीक है? Now, what are the other radiographic features of fibrous dysplasia in addition to this? 
remember it is merging with the maxillary sinus it's merging with everything it is causing complete obliteration of the maxillary sinus as it is completely invisible there is something called as thumb print appearance thumb print appearance i'll just write it down appearance thumb print appearance or fingerprint appearance is again the hallmark of fibrous dysplasia this appearance of fingerprint or the thumb print appearance is actually not seen in any other condition in the relation to this if you see your finger or thumb can you see can you make out that there are certain whorls of fingerprint appearance like appearance similar appearance is seen in fibrous dysplasia is it clear so these are the certain unique radiographic features and one more thing about fibrous dysplasia in fact this has come as a question what is the commonest site of fibrous dysplasia it is actually maxilla it is not the mandible whenever rarely it will occur in mandible it will cause one very very unique thing of the posterior mandible what unique thing it is the only condition that will cause superior displacement of inferior alveolar nerve canal this represents the only condition in which there is superior displacement of the nerve canal only condition that exists in the entire radiology all the condition orogenic cystic tumor what do they do they cause inferior displacement of the nerve canal but fiber dysplasia represents the only condition that causes superior displacement of the nerve canal that is a very very common viva question which is generally asked everywhere okay now that was about moniostotic fiber dysplasia now coming on to the polyostotic fiber dysplasia now in the polyostotic fiber dysplasia we generally how do we differentiate it the only difference is there is an involvement of more than two bones it is called as polyostotic fiber dysplasia the hallmark of polyostotic fiber dysplasia is that it is generally divided into two parts jaffe lichtenstein syndrome and one more syndrome called as mckeown albright syndrome please don't get scared with these heavy words theek hai now the only difference is jaffe lichtenstein syndrome i just written it down it is when fiber dysplasia involves two or three bones and it is associated with cafo a late pigmentation we call it as jaffe lichtenstein syndrome is it clear now this is how a cafo late spots clears up can you make out cafo late spots yeah we do you guys take coffee with milk yes that is the coffee with milk appearance is seen in cafo late spot this is just to show you how a cafo late spot actually seen there please don't go across what is written as coastline of maine and california i'll just come edit it later a cafo late spot is generally seen in multiple neurofibromatosis and polyostotic fibrous dysplasia theek hai now that was about lichtenstein syndrome now what happens is there is multiple bone involvement there is cafo late spot the we know this is now jaffe lichtenstein syndrome but what is there is certain multiple endocrine conditions like these few conditions which are written in this particular slide now remember mckeown albright syndrome there is one common question asked throughout everywhere is if mckeown albright syndrome occurs in males it cannot be mckeown albright syndrome reason it represents the only condition that occurs exclusively in females exclusively i have written females in bold can you guys see it means that mckeown albright syndrome can always and always occur in females only if it is occurring in males it means that this is not mckeown albright syndrome it means it is some other condition and which we guys need to investigate it is it clear now i just 
uh, done something called as coastline of Maine and coastline of California. Now you guys might be wondering why I have written it. Well, Maine and California, these are the states in US, right? Now, coastline of Maine is the appearance of the kefir lace spot which is seen in neurofibromatosis. Coastline of Maine is seen in neurofibromatosis. The coastline of Maine is actually very irregular. That is why the appearance has been called as coastline of Maine. And coastline of California is a very smooth, regular, continuous border. That is, if you can see the both the coffee with milk appearances, you can make out the difference. It is very irregular in coastline of Maine. Whereas in coastline of California, the appearance is very smooth, uniform, continuous. Coastline of California is the seen in fibrous displacement. Okay? Coastline of Maine is seen in, we come across a condition called as multiple neurofibromatosis. Whereas coastline of California is seen in our fibrous dysplasia. I have written a word called hockey stick deformity. Can you guys see hockey stick deformity? Well, this is generally leg leg discrepancy due to the involvement of the upper portion of femur. Remember, this condition is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. In polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, remember not one bone but multiple bones are involved. And when fibrous dysplasia involves your femur, then it leads to enlargement of the upper portion of femur leading to a leg leg discrepancy and that is called as hockey stick deformity. Okay? Now radiographic features again monostotic, polyostotic, same stuff. No difference at all. Fingerprint appearance, thumbprint appearance. Uh, now if I ask you, cotton wool appearance is seen in? Cotton wool appearance is seen in? Cotton wool appearance. Where is cotton wool appearance seen in? Paget's. Exactly. Good. The cotton wool appearance is seen in Paget's disease. What is the other condition which is sometimes confused with Paget's? It is fibrous dysplasia. Some students tend to confuse and they start saying that cotton wool appearance is seen in fibrous dysplasia. Remember, cotton wool appearance is not seen in fibrous dysplasia. I am using the word not. Is it clear? Uh, before coming on to the second question, I just forgot one more stuff, important stuff. How do you treat fibrous dysplasia? How do you treat cherubism? How do you treat cherubism? Treatment of cherubism. Do you do surgery? What do you do? Or do you do any radiation therapy? Do you guys do radiotherapy? Yes or no? Surgery aap karte ho? Radiotherapy karte ho? No. We do not do radiotherapy. We actually do something called as, I will just write it down for you guys, cosmetic recontouring. Cosmetic, uh, the R is missing, is this cosmetic recontouring. Okay? What do you mean by the guys, cosmetic recontouring? By the word cosmetic recontouring, we mean we just do a such kind of surgically, we do not dispose of a size of the particular area. What we do is, we just simply surgically in elevate the area in such a way that it appears similar to the normal area. How do we treat for cherubism? We do not do any treatment for cherubism. Cherubism generally gets treated on its own. There is one very very common MCQ question. What if we do a radiation therapy? Yes, it is no treatment. What is if we do radiation therapy in these patients? If you radiation therapy in patients, what will be the most co biggest complication you can come across in these patients. If we do radiation therapy, well, it's a very, very common MCQ question. If we do radiation therapy in these patients, it will lead to a very lethal condition called as osteogenic sarcoma. If you do radiation therapy, if you do radiation therapy in these patients, either cerebrism or fibrous dysplasia, this will lead to a condition called as osteogenic sarcoma. Is it clear? Yes, it is osteogenic sarcoma. Should we go on to the next question now? Is it clear? Any doubts, you can just write it down about fiber dysplasia, cherubism, anything. Pages I will be covering a little later. Is it clear? Should we go on to the next question? 
यस नाउ द सेकंड क्वेश्चन इज मल्टीपल ऑस्टियोमास एंड सुपरनुमिटीज मे बी एसोसिएटेड विद वी हैव फॉलोइंग चॉइसेस गॉलन सिंड्रोम रुबिनस्टन टेबी सिंड्रोम गार्डनर सिंड्रोम क्लीडोक्रेनियल डिस्प्लेजिया एंड एक्टोडर्मल डिस्प्लेजिया मल्टीपल ऑस्टियोमास how do these osteomas actually appear as now if you can see this slide multiple osteomas can you see this this patient has got a huge swelling which is seen and we can see the lateral part of this patient in the lateral part of the patient you can make out certain swelling is there and when we took a lateral surface of this patient or lateral skull of this patient we came across these multiple radiopacities which are pretty well defined and these are actually called as multiple osteoma on a skin examination this patient also had multiple epidermal inclusion cyst okay this is the back part back of the patient in the back of the patient when we do a clinical examination we can make out that there are certain swellings which are visible in this patient now what is this swelling generally seen in in addition to this we came across intestinal polyps also in this patient but can you make out this multiple polyps in the large intestine and doing in ct of this patient we also came across certain desmoid tumors okay so this condition is most probably turning out to be and again multiple supernumerity multiple supernumerity is there and multiple osteomas are also there in this patient can you make out so in addition to this we can safely say that this condition is actually gardner syndrome so what happens in gardner syndrome it is a actually an autosomal dominant disorder which is characterized by intestinal polyposes as we have come across everything theek okay? hai so the genetic defect is found in a small region along just write down one word chromosome 5 that is more than enough theek okay? hai is it clear should we go on to the next question chromosome 5 next question yes now this is again pretty easy question radiographically the anterior palatine foramen may be mistaken for we have these following choices an incisor canal cyst a median alveolar cyst a radicular cyst a nasal alveolar cyst and a globular maxillary cyst now an incisor canal cyst generally seen in anterior maxilla as the name suggests incisor canal because an incisor canal is present in anterior maxilla what is a median alveolar cyst what is a median alveolar cyst yes that's it median alveolar cyst is the same cyst which is generally seen posteriorly radicular cyst well we all know what is a radicular cyst what is a nasal alveolar cyst have you heard of nasal alveolar cyst nasal alveolar cyst is just another name of nasal labial cyst have you heard of nasal labial cyst well nasal labial cyst is a different cyst which is generally this i have written it down nasal labial cyst the nasal labial cyst is completely different from a median alveolar or an incisive canal cyst how because nasal labial cyst represents the only condition or the only cyst that does not have any radiographic feature okay in nasal labial or the fourth point in nasal alveolar or the nasal labial cyst does not have any radiographic feature theek okay? hai a globular maxillary cyst well we know what is a globular maxillary cyst so now depending on this what do you think is the most likely choice which you guys can do it now an incisive canal cyst do you think an incisive canal cyst can be mistaken for an anterior palatine foramen What is an anterior palatine foramen? Don't you think it is incisive canal only? What is anterior palatine foramen? Well, yes, it is. Can you make out this slide? This is the anterior palatine foramen, and this is the classical heart-shaped radiolucency which is seen in incisive canal cyst, or the nasal palatine duct cyst, or the median palatine cyst. so the correct answer will be incisive canal cyst median alveolar cyst is something which is faced posteriorly that is why we cannot confuse a median alveolar with this but a radicular cyst don't you think a radicular cyst is occasionally seen or come sometimes over here so 
a radicular cyst and incisive canal cyst can be confused with an incisor canal cyst now if you see this slide carefully if you see this slide carefully we can see something as more than 6 mm i have written what does this imply more than 6 mm yes when the incisor canal is till the size of 6 mm we just call it as an enlarged incisor canal but the moment the diameter goes more than 6 mm we start calling this condition as an incisor canal cyst theek hai so heart shaped radiolucency is again the hallmark of nasopalatine duct cyst what do you think is the hallmark of globulomacular cyst how does a globulomacular cyst appears as radiographically globulomacular cyst well should i write it down or you know it if you can write it down inverted pear shaped radiolucency inverted pear shaped radiolucency which is seen in globulomacular cyst is it clear so these are the few examples of the non neurogenic cyst in which we have an incisive canal cyst or a nasopalatine cyst a globulomacular cyst nasolabial cyst and we also know certain other non neurogenic cyst also like we have the cyst of staphne duct cyst staphne duct cyst i am sure you would have heard of staphne duct cyst staphne duct cyst is generally seen in our posterior mandible in addition to staphne duct cyst we also have another pseudo cyst called as aneurysmal bone cyst should we go on to the next question now fourth question excessively dark excessively dark radiographs will result from now this is a pretty easy question isn't it what will happen if we do under development if we do under development agar aap under develop karoge to kya hoga the radiograph will not be dark obviously it will be light a light radiograph will is a hallmark of under development what about over exposure over exposure will definitely lead to dark radiograph or not yes what about backward placement of the film if you place the film instead of placing it like this you place the film opposite then what will happen if we do the backward placement of the film if we do the backward placement of the film obviously the film will not, can you see no you cannot hear me ah uh, okay when we do the backward placement of the film we can see some car tire track pattern appearances but it will not be dark okay it will not be dark what about if we do excessive milli amperage if we do excessive milli amperage what will happen if we do excessive milli amperage it will result in again in a dark radiograph theek hai so dark radiograph is caused by you can just write it down i cannot hear you so an excessively dark radiograph will generally be seen in two conditions over exposure and excessive milli amperage so what is your answer guys is it a b c d e what is it it is fourth or hey definitely excessive milli amperage hey is it two and four both of them so the correct answer is choice which choice it is c isn't it is it clear yes now well uh, these are the other conditions in which we see over development accidental exposure improper safe lighting too high developer concentration all this stuff so should we go on to the next question filters now this is right remember the very first chapter of the radiation physics slightly boring chapter but remember the questions do come from these chapters a lot what are filters what are filters if i ask you what is a filter made up of is it made up of lead yes or no lead no a filter is not made up of filter theek hai filter is not made up of lead rather it is made up of filter is made up of, sorry a filter is made up of aluminium it is not made up of lead right it is aluminium theek hai so why do we place an aluminium filter in the place of the path of x ray beam do we need to increase the contrast 
do you think a filter can increase the contrast well slightly okay but not an exact answer will it actually reduce the film density no it will no that is a grit to remove the scattered radiation but you are ideally correct in the way to remove the unreduced exposure we sometimes indirectly use filters to reduce the patient radiation dose okay reduce exposure time is not done by the filter it is neither it does it reduce film density so we are actually confused between two choices choice a and choice d so what are we left with where is the filter actually placed can you see this presentation we have an x ray tube we have a filter okay and if you see the magnified part if you see the magnified part in which you can very clearly make out that the filter the basic purpose of the filter is to remove x rays of lower energy ठीक है to remove the x rays of lower energy we use aluminum filter what is the difference between a filter and a collimator well a collimator removes the x rays of any energy can you make out a filter will remove the x rays of lower energy whereas a collimator will remove lower o ya higher o a collimator will remove it irrespective of the strength or the energy but a filter will remove only the x rays of lower energy now i'll just ask you a simple question guys x rays of lower energy will have a higher wavelength or a lower wavelength you can just write it down i cannot hear you sons x rays of lower energy will have a higher wavelength or they will have a lower wavelength remember this question is a very common viva question x rays of higher the energy the wavelength increases or it reduces what it happens no higher is the energy wavelength is lower there is a formula called as an energy is inversely proportional to wavelength theek okay? hai please uh, just pardon me for the spelling because i'm writing it pretty fast theek okay? hai energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength so higher is the energy lower is the wavelength in fact there is a very common question which was asked by me last year that in which if what is the energy of the scattered radiation actually depends on it actually depends on the wavelength higher is the wavelength lower is the energy lower is the energy higher is the wavelength is it clear is it clear about this yeah now just try to understand the concept of a filter can you see this graph yes definitely now you can make out the red part is the unfiltered area where the filtered area has got slightly less energy now what happens in this it actually mean that the unfiltered part will be having more quantity but the moment we start removing the lower energy as you can see in this diagram can you see in this diagram if you can see in this diagram what we can make out in this that x rays of lower energy in this case 40 and 30 have been removed so what is actually happening if we total all the five supposedly we have five x rays supposing we have five x rays of different energies 30 40 50 60 70 they are coming out of the x ray tube carrying different energies 30 40 50 60 70 we just total it it comes out to be 250 by 5 so the average energy is 50 right except now what does the filter do a filter removes x rays of lower energy so what will happen 30 and 40 will get filtered or absorbed by the aluminum so the quantity of the x rays will actually get reduced instead of 5 x rays now we have only 3 x rays but if now we do the average 70 plus 60 plus 50 what is the average energy now 60 so when we compare an unfiltered x ray beam with a filtered x ray beam a filtered x ray beam will have a higher energy but lower quantity is it clear both these two things are actually ulta 
opposite of each other but they are definitely connected to each other when we place a filter in the path it reduces the quantity but what it does is it increases the average energy of the x-ray b is it clear is it clear should we go on to the next part yeah now the correct answer is as you remember choice a and choice d ke beech mein confusion tha the choice a was the filter was aapka contrast mein tha aur choice d tha aapka lower energy yani ki patient ka exposure kam karna when we remove the x-rays of lower energy are not be helping the patient we are actually helping the patient by removing the x-rays of lower energy is it clear now choice d any doubt till so far if you guys have any doubt till now you can just write it down or we'll go on to the next if you guys don't write anything okay next question now this is a question which is really a clinically oriented question which you guys can definitely be expected to ask in the exam please see the have a look at the question contrast yes डॉक्टर रेतु जिस इज जस्ट आस्किंग क्वेश्चन अबाउट कॉन्ट्रास्ट नाउ ए कॉन्ट्रास्ट हाउ डज ए फिल्टर हेल्प इन द कॉन्ट्रास्ट नाउ कॉन्ट्रास्ट इज समथिंग विच यू गैज नीड टू नो हैज गॉट वॉट इज द कॉन्ट्रास्ट कॉन्ट्रास्ट क्या होता है वेल इफ आई जस्ट आस्क यू कॉन्ट्रास्ट इन द लेम एंड टर्न ए कॉन्ट्रास्ट सिंपली मीन्स डिफरेंस मतलब डोंट बी से वॉट ए कॉन्ट्रास्ट इट इज इज इन इट we say what is the difference it is like a person if he is wearing white shirt and black trouser we say it is a good contrast but if he is wearing a gray shirt and gray trouser he we say he is having a poor contrast or a poor difference isn't it so a contrast basically means white areas and the black areas on the film when we place a filter in the path of the x ray beam we remove the lower energy x rays and we do increase the contrast theek okay? hai but we are able to do it very minutely not very majorly so between the two choices of contrast and reduced patient exposure the better answer is reduced patient exposure theek okay? hai regarding the contrast i have a question so don't worry i will be covering contrast in detail okay is it clear okay now sixth question a patient receiving daily corticosteroid therapy a patient supposedly he is taking daily corticosteroid for the past 6 month he requires a surgical extraction of the tooth 38 it's not 3.8 38 prior to surgery this patient drug therapy should be modified by so uh, i think all of you have have looked at these four choices which do you think is the best answer do we need to stop the corticosteroid therapy or we need to increase it just stopping or increasing no we should never stop a corticosteroid therapy if we stop a corticosteroid therapy it will yes it is increasing when we stop the corticosteroid therapy it will actually reduce the patient's immune response so the correct answer is increasing corticosteroid now between choice c and d which is the better answer is it for one week or on the day of the operation which is the better answer of the two yes it is choice d when we increase the corticosteroid we do not really want to increase it for one use we why do we want to increase it we will just do it on the day of the procedure okay yes this is the choice answer d now corticosteroids now i have just written i have written olp theek hai it is 24 hours right corticosteroids in olp now it doesn't mean in olp only we can use it in everywhere so i'll just ask you a few questions regarding systemic corticosteroid i'll just ask you what is the maximum amount of systemic corticosteroids you can give in a patient what is the maximum amount of systemic steroids which can be given in a patient is it 20 mg 40 mg 60 mg 100 mg kitna de sakte ho aap 30 40 50 60 80 100 you can just write it down it is 60 mg 60 mg is the maximum amount of systemic steroids which can be given now if you see the question carefully a patient receiving daily corticosteroid was given this 
now they have it's a very easy question in fact if i dare say simply because of the fact that they have not written anything about the quantity if i ask you this patient was taking 20 mg corticosteroid therapy daily then what will be the amount of corticosteroid which need to be given on the day of procedure if the patient was taking 20 mg we need to increase it theek hai but how much we need to increase it yes it is doubling we need to double the steroid dose on the day of the procedure what about 30 mg supposedly if she is taking 30 mg then what will be the amount of systemic steroid we need to give 30 mg 60 mg correct what about 40 mg if the patient is taking 40 mg what is the amount of systemic steroid we need to be given in this patient 40 mg yes very good that's the main difference if the patient is taking 40 mg we do not need to give the patient 80 mg why remember i had asked you what is the maximum amount of systemic steroid it is 60 so that is why this question becomes really important so when you see the question they keep on asking you 40 mg 20 mg 30 mg 50 mg remember when it is 30 mg we are doubled it to 60 but when it becomes 40 the answer will remain 60 if your question is asked 50 it is still 60 what will happen if the patient is taking 60 mg daily then also it will still be 60 mg very good. okay is it clear about systemic steroids now this is the main question which is asked it is generally asked regarding the dosages so this question was in fact very easy they are not asked us anything about this theek okay? hai now topical i have written something called as topical corticosteroid what do you mean by the topical by the word topical i mean local application of the systemic steroid now by the local steroid application do we need to alter our procedure for a local steroid if the patient is taking topical steroid do we need to double it or increase it or decrease it anything absolutely no we do not need to modify anything when the patient is taking topical steroids remember this theek okay? hai for systemic we need to alter but not for topical steroid so among these four choices please try to remember the first one trinsinolone acetonide try and please try to remember this name well all these are given definitely but trinsinolone acetonide or Are one percent carboxy methyl cellulose. That is just the name of the paste. But the steroid is trimethylone. Try to remember this name because this is most common example of the topical steroid. Okay. If I ask you which is the commonest systemic steroid given, what will be your answer? It will be prednisolone. The commonest systemic steroid is prednisolone, but the commonest yes, it is prednisolone. But the commonest topical steroid is trimethylone acetonide is it clear till here theek hai any questions about systemic steroids no okay ah oh, yes i forgot about this well if i will ask you one question if i give the patient systemic glucocorticosteroid therapy now what will happen If I give a patient a cortical steroid therapy, remember there will be a suppression of adrenal gland for the patient for at least one year. So if the patient, if the patient has done any procedure of systemic steroid being taken, always remember the fact that patient should be evaluated properly, and he should be. taken in consideration that you can suspect adrenocortical suppression if the patient has been taking a dose of 20 mg or more of cortisone or its equivalent for a period of 2 weeks theek okay? hai if a patient i'll just repeat it again in guys it not guys do not got it if a patient took steroids for 2 weeks that is it duration is important if the patient took steroids for 2 weeks or longer definitely this will lead to suppression of adrenal glands 
now my next question is for how long for how long these adrenal glands are suppressed when we give the patient systemic steroid for two weeks is it one what one one month or one year yes it is one year very good one year there will be suppression it will not be no suppression there will be suppression but it will not be stress related it means that suppose a patient has been given systemic steroid in the month of december his adrenal gland will be suppressed till next december but it doesn't mean when in the month of february he undergoes a stress response his stress response will come back to normal within one month are you getting it two different things when a patient takes systemic steroid for two weeks or longer this leads to suppression of adrenal glands for one year okay but the patient's stress response will return within one month okay so these are two entirely different things but very confusing that's why i have just written it down is it clear now seven question following a radiation therapy to the mandible extraction of the mandibular teeth is most likely to result uh, okay i will repeat it i will repeat it now uh, uh, just repeat it now when a patient takes systemic steroids for two weeks okay this leads to suppression of the supra adrenal adrenal glands for one year but it doesn't mean that the patient if he goes through any stress he will just have any problem the patient stress response will become normal within one month okay that's the difference is it clear now so this is the seventh question following the radiation therapy to the mandible extraction of the mandibular teeth now i have written the word mandible it should give you a massive hint which i am asking you yes it's a very easy answer isn't it osteomyelitis the moment i said it is mandible the correct answer becomes osteomyelitis the possibility of fracture is there but it doesn't mean that it will lead to osteomyelitis and what is that osteomyelitis called as once there is radiation therapy it is called as osteoradionecrosis which is a pathological process which sometimes follow heavy radiation of bone and is characterized by chronic painful infection and necrosis okay now osteoradionecrosis is also called as radio osteomyelitis now what are the questions which have been asked in this question what are the questions which have been asked in this question okay now the certain questions which have been asked in osteomyelitis osteoradionecrosis if a patient comes to you if a patient comes to you and he says he or she says that i am about to go for radiotherapy so i want you to extract my tooth what will you do i will repeat the question a patient needs to be extracted you have to extract his or her tooth and the patient is about to undergo radiation therapy for the next 4 months okay so when will you do the radiation therapy 2 weeks before the radiation therapy start 4 weeks before 6 weeks before or 8 weeks before so i repeat the question you guys got the question no extraction ideally yes you will not like to do the extraction but the patient is in extreme pain 12 weeks before yes it is 3 months exactly the patient who is needs to go for radiation therapy you need to do the procedure at least 3 months before the procedure before the 3 months of the procedure a patient needs to be extracted yes minimum 2 weeks according to uk but that is minimum is simply because when the patient is having emergency okay but i believe what they say is 4 weeks is generally supposed to be a safe time 4 weeks is supposed to be a safe time for the extraction what if i'll just alter or modify the question what if a patient now comes during the radiation therapy a patient is going undergoing radiation therapy of the cancer of the buccal mucosa he is having extreme pain will you do the extraction or not yes or no 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 yes 
No. Remember, if you do a procedure, especially in extraction, in this, during radiation therapy, you are actually putting the patient under an extreme risk of osteonecrosis. So you would not like that to happen. That is why you will try to avoid the procedure as much as possible. You will try to do pulp extirpation or root canal correct. Now I will do a third alteration of this question. Radiation therapy is now finished. Is it clear? Radiation therapy is now finished. But now you want to extract that particular tooth. So after how many days or how many weeks will you do this procedure? After the radiation therapy has now got finished. Will you do the attraction two weeks after radiation therapy, four weeks after radiation therapy, eight weeks after radiation therapy, or 12 weeks after radiation therapy? You got my question? Radiation therapy is now finished. Patient comes to you. You need to extract this tooth now. Two weeks after radiation therapy, four weeks after radiation therapy, eight weeks after radiation therapy, or 12 weeks after radiation therapy. Yes, the correct answer is again three months after the radiation therapy. In fact, the ideal answer should actually we should have been six months. Okay? Six months or 24 weeks. But since in this choices I have not given you 24 weeks answer, so you are left with the best answer of 12 weeks. Okay? Yes, six months is ideal, but you can go for the procedure after 12 weeks. Okay? Why do we want to wait for so much of time? Simply because the area is hypoxia, hypovascularity and hypocellularity. So which will lead to a massive risk of osteonecrosis. Okay? Now this is I just written this, just a small yes to recover the blood supply. What actually happens in osteonecrosis? We have this acute inflammation which leads to increased intramedullary pressure. Just go through this slide and just I uh, just written it down so that you can just have a concept of this so that you can understand the concept of osteonecrosis. Okay? What is the radiographic feature of osteonecrosis? Can you guys write it down? What is the main radiographic feature of osteonecrosis? How does an osteonecrosis classical appearance of osteonecrosis? You guys can write it down. No? How does an osteonecrosis appear as radiographically? We have certain common radiographic appearances, isn't it? Like I told you tennis racket appearance for orangeonic myxoma, isn't it? Cobweb, no, 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 it is not cobweb. Cobweb appearance is not seen in this. The appearance which is seen for osteonecrosis is moth-eaten appearance. So, moth-eaten appearance. And sometimes it is also called as worm-eaten appearance also. So both the moth-eaten appearance and the worm-eaten appearances are the hallmark features of not only osteomyelitis but also osteonecrosis. Is it clear? Okay. Is it clear about osteomyelitis and osteonecrosis? Now, if the next question which I ask you, how do you treat osteonecrosis? How will you treat osteonecrosis now? Will you give him antibiotics? What will you do? And which antibiotic? You can very well expect this question, osteonecrosis. These are the radiographic appearances which I have just written it down. How will you do the treatment of osteonecrosis? I hope you guys know what is sequestral now. This is why I have written it. It is basically your necros bone is called as sequestra. Yes, sequestra. Okay. Is this slide clear now? Which is in front of you? Okay. Dead bone. Yes. Removal. Uh, yes. The best answer is actually removal of dead bone. But sometimes it's not possible, isn't it? Because a patient is having osteonecrosis. And if you do any surgery, you might be having a risk of further aggravating the condition other than removal of dead bone which is the next best answer it is no the correct answer is this one initial treatment is directed at control wearing infection antibiotics yes it is hbo antibiotics plus irrigation ultrasound plus irrigation 
Now, in this slide, I have deliberately not written antibiotic. Which antibiotic is given? Can you guys write it down? Which antibiotic? Is it amoxicillin? Is it? No, it is not amoxicillin then. It is? Slightly different answer, vancomycin. Vancomycin. Vancomycin, which is given as the choice of antibiotic in these patients, and in fact, this is the best answer to do the treatment, vancomycin. But as one of you answered me, uh, removal of dead bone, antibiotic, in addition to antibiotic, it is this thing, hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So remember, hyperbaric oxygen room, it is a special air controlled room in which the patient is placed in this in order to ensure a massive supply of oxygen to ensure, again, recontinuation of the blood supply to help us in the management of the osteonecrosis. Is it clear about this? Okay, antibiotics, vancomycin, hyperbaric oxygen, and then removal of the dead bone. Now, one more question in this. Can you see this? Can you make out this appearance? This appearance is called as onion skin appearance. Okay? Onion peel, onion skin is the same thing. Now, the reason why I have written it down, yes, it is onion peel. In which all condition do you see onion peel appearance? In addition to this, remember garage osteomyelitis. This is not osteonecrosis. I am repeating it. This is not osteonecrosis, this is Garay's osteomyelitis. Okay? So please do not confuse osteonecrosis with Garay's osteomyelitis. Garay's osteomyelitis is what is it? Is it suppurative or non-suppurative? It is non-suppurative. Non-suppurative type of osteomyelitis is called as Garay's osteomyelitis and in which all condition do you see onion peel appearance in addition to Garay's osteomyelitis? It is, we see this in so many conditions. I, in fact, if I start writing, it will take me 10 minutes almost. So I'm just writing it, sarcomas. What are the sarcomas, you know? Every sarcoma which you can think of, I mean bony, event sarcoma, fibrosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, osteosarcoma. In addition to this, you will be surprised when I write down all these findings. You will be thinking I'm writing it wrong, but actually in all these conditions, there is this kind of appearance which is seen in this patient. TB, syphilis. Uh, it is not hemangioma. It is hemangioma. Okay. <laughs> it is hemangioma. TB, syphilis, hemangioma. Sometimes in metastatic carcinoma. Okay. In all these conditions, we come across these findings. Is it clear? Onion peel appearance, which is seen in, in addition to sarcoma. TB, syphilis, hemangioma. Now, if I ask you a simple question, okay, among the sarcomas, we have four sarcomas, right? Osteo, Evans, Fibro, Condro, bony sarcomas. Which is the commonest sarcoma of the children? Commonest sarcoma of the children. Commonest malignancy of the children in the jaws. It is a sarcoma, since I am asking you sarcoma, which is the commonest malignancy of the Events of the uh, jaws in children. It is which one? Evans fibrochondro osteo. It is Evans sarcoma. Evans sarcoma is the commonest malignancy of the children. Okay. What is the commonest malignancy of the young adults? What is the commonest malignancy of young adults? By young adults, I mean age group of 20 to 30 years. Commonest malignancy of the Adults, it is not squamous cell carcinoma. I'll give you a hint, okay? Because I'm asking you malignancy of the bones. I'm not asking you malignancy of the oral cavity. Try to remember this. Yes, it is osteogenic sarcoma. The osteogenic sarcoma is the commonest malignancy of the adults. If I ask you commonest malignancy of the jaws in elderly patients, then what is your answer? What is the commonest malignancy of the jaws in elderly patient? 
and lonely patient i mean again the age group of 60 years i am asking you malignancy of the jaw for children you told me correctly evans for adults you told me oxygen sarcoma what about the adults it is should i write it down it is slightly difficult answer but you guys should know this metastatic carcinoma what is metastatic carcinoma secondary carcinoma is called as metastatic carcinoma by secondary carcinoma what do you mean by secondary carcinoma a patient has got a primary cancer in breast lungs kidney prostate and through that area it metastasizes and ultimately reaches the posterior mandible or any a particular area that is called as secondary carcinomas like she has correctly written originating from somewhere else is primary that is called as primary primary cancer is in breast lungs or kidney secondary is every mandible is it clear till here should we go on to the next question now eighth question most cases of erosive oral lichen planus are effectively treated by cytotoxics antifungals antibacterial anti malarial corticosteroid so what do you think is the best answer what do you mean by cytotoxics in fact by cytotoxics they are actually asking you chemotherapy it is corticosteroids corticosteroids are the hallmark of the treatment of erosive oral lichen planus in fact if you remember i had in fact shown you a slide ये ओरल लाइकिंग प्लानर्स में आप सिस्टमिक थ्रोइड हाउ डू यू डू इट रिमेंबर दैट स्लाइड शुड आई एक्सप्लेन इट अगेन रिमेंबर दिस स्लाइड सो दिस वाज व्हाट आई हैड ट्राइड टू टोल्ड यू अबाउट ओरल लाइकिंग प्लानर्स नाउ ओरल लाइकिंग प्लानर्स आई हैव स्पेसिफिकली रिटन अबाउट इरेजर वेरिएंट इजंट इट oral lichen planus if i ask you certain questions about oral lichen planus which is the commonest type of oral lichen planus is it reticular annular plaque type erosive atrophic which sub type of lichen planus is the most commonly seen in oral patients no it is not plaque type the correct answer is reticular type the reticular type of lichen planus is the most common type of variety seen in the oral cavity among all these six types of lichen planus theek hai among all these six types of oral lichen planus in which type there is the maximum malignant potential is of which sub type should i explain it again question which type of lichen planus has got the maximum malignant correct it is erosive very good erosive type of lichen planus has got the maximum malignant potential what is the malignant potential of lichen planus by the word malignant potential i actually mean is it 1 to 2% 4 to 6% 10% 30% 50% what is the malignant potential of oral lichen planus reticular type is the commonest variety erosive type has got malignant potential and which type has got or and which is the malignant potential of the lichen planus overall percentage by percentage i mean when you see 100 patients when you see 100 patient how much or how many percent of the patients are likely to turn into malignancy it is you guys are partially correct it is 1% it is 1% okay so 1% is the correct answer whenever the word lichen planus come you should know of one phenomena what is this have you uh, can you guys uh, see what i have written cobnus phenomena what is cobnus phenomena the cobnus phenomena just states that whenever there is a constant amount of trauma whenever there is a constant amount of trauma the patient is unable to heal properly and this entire process is called as cobnus phenomena if you are asked a simple viva question oral lichen planus and cutaneous lichen planus cutaneous means skin cutaneous lichen planus and oral lichen planus which is more recalcitrant to the treatment or which is more resistant to the treatment 
what would be your answer oral or cutaneous of the two which is more difficult to treat oral or cutaneous it is oral very good why oral simply because of the word which i had written upstairs that is cobnus phenomena so what is cobnus phenomena in the cobnus phenomena there is a constant trauma whenever the patient is chewing continuously he is actually traumatizing that area and ensuring that area is not getting healed properly again and again that is why we have cobnus phenomena the name of the entire process is it clear about this is it clear generally lichen planus is bilateral isn't it if it is bilateral it has to be lichen planus but among all the sex types we have one sub type which is never bilateral it is always unilateral which sub type no it is not uh, erosive it is plaque type the plaque type of oral lichen planus is perhaps the only type in which it is always unilateral it is never bilateral whereas all the other types of lichen planus are hallmark or seen as bilaterally but plaque type it will always be seen as unilateral is it clear should we go on to the next slide now main question the most common malignant tumor of the tongue is an well uh, you can safely say the benign tumors papilloma is an example of a benign tumor fibroma is an example of a benign tumor so we are left with choices choice b choice d and choice e is granular cell myoblastoma benign or malignant granular cell myoblastoma is actually benign so we are left with choices b and choice d the correct answer is choice d ठीक है squamous cell carcinoma is the most common malignant tumor of the tongue ठीक है and this is our oral cancer now in oral cancer again there are certain questions which are pretty common and asked everywhere throughout the world if i ask you a simple question if i ask you a simple question oral cancer is oral cancer more commonly caused by smoking or smokeless tobacco what will be your answer is oral cancer more commonly caused by smoking or smokeless tobacco what will be your answer smokeless what will be your answers well uh, the reason why you guys have written <laughs> it is actually smoking the correct answer is smoking it is not smokeless why the reason why you guys always think of smokeless first simply because of the reason that in our colleges in our ug time we generally see those patients who are of laborers isn't it they are lower socio economic status they simply cannot afford smoking so whatever cases of cancer we see we see in those patients who cannot afford smoking so what do they do they buy all this tobacco smokeless stuff which is very cheap 1 to 2 rupees whereas smokeless smoking is more expensive that is why it goes in our minds that smokeless is more common but rather it is the smoking which is the more common variant of malignancy is it clear carcinoma and sarcoma of the two which has got the more malignant potential <clears throat> carcinoma and sarcoma which has got more malignant potential or you can say it has got more risky prognosis or more poor prognosis carcinoma or sarcoma it is sarcoma sarcoma has got a poorer prognosis as compared to carcinoma why because the carcinoma spreads through lymphatics and the sarcoma spreads through hematogenous routes theek hai sarcoma sarcoma spread through blood or connective tissue whereas the carcinoma spread through lymphatic route that is why sarcoma have got a poorer prognosis theek hai now if i ask you a simple question which malignancy has got the worst prognosis which of all the malignancies you know all the malignancies 
scammer cell there's the sarcoma everything you know which particular malignancy has got the worst prognosis by the worst prognosis i mean if a patient gets this it means he is about to generally die within a month or two months no it is not scammer cell carcinoma scammer cell carcinoma has got a relatively better prognosis isn't it so which malignancy yes very good it is malignant melanoma malignant melanoma has got the worst prognosis why what is so special about malignant melanoma simply because malignant melanoma spreads through both the lymphatic route as well as through the connective tissue route that is why it represents one of the very few conditions which has got a very 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 poor prognosis theek hai malignant melanoma now if i ask you an extremely opposite question now which malignancy has got the best prognosis in fact if you no it is not squamous cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma does not has not got the best prognosis it has got an okay prognosis but not the best prognosis which malignancy has got the best prognosis basal cell carcinoma is the second best basal cell carcinoma is the second best malignancy with the best prognosis in addition to this try to remember of a sarcoma remember i told you examples of four sarcomas evans fibro chondro osteo remember in addition to those four there is one more sarcoma just try to think of one more sarcoma okay i'll give you a hint it occurs in hiv patients only yes it is kaposi sarcoma so kaposi sarcoma has got the best prognosis of all the malignancies that exist theek hai kaposi sarcoma has got the best sarcoma and uh, best prognosis even though remember if i ask you carcinoma and sarcoma which has got the better prognosis it is carcinoma but if i ask you which malignancy has got the best prognosis surprisingly the answer is a kaposi sarcoma is it clear please do not mix these two things overall sarcomas have got a poor prognosis but kaposi sarcoma spreads through local route only that is why it does not have got such a poor prognosis as compared to the all other malignancies is it clear now certain questions which i feel are important for you guys especially the epidemiological part so please write it down oral cancer what is it it's the most common cancer of the lung prostate colorectal stomach and bladder it is the sixth most commonest cancer in the world okay what i mean by the local route what i mean by local route is that remember basal cell carcinoma it is spreading through just the local route so just a tumor how a tumor is growing similarly kaposi sarcoma will also be growing like that that is the only difference theek okay? hai this is i mean by local route is it clear now according to who in males it is the sixth most common cancer and in females it is the tenth commonest cancer is it clear just try to remember the sixth and the tenth no need to remember all these other names breast and all that stuff okay now this question is a bit controversial if i say which is the commonest site for intraoral cancer well as i have written in the first slide it is the tongue so tongue is the commonest site for intraoral cancer among the european and the american populations theek okay? hai and even australian population also but if i ask you among india among the asian population the answer is actually buccal vestibule why because mucus tobacco is placed is more commonly used in developing countries whereas in the developed countries patients tend to use more of smoking cigarettes weed so that is why tongue is a more common risk for intraoral cancer pan tobacco all that stuff is more commonly done in asian population is it clear uh now if i ask you among the smoking there are so many types of smoking we have cigarette we have weed we have pipe hookah and all that stuff which type has got the worst prognosis for the development of oral cancer among all these types is it cigarette is it bd gutka what sorry not gutka is an example of a smokeless 
cigars no <laughs> well the one with that sherlock holmes smokes isn't it pipe pipe smoking okay in the pipe smoking we have actually the raw tobacco clays inside it and due to which the pipe smoking becomes the most common or the worst possibility for an carcinomatous transformation okay now there is something called as reverse smoking i am sure aapne final year mein community mein padha hoga what is reverse smoking isn't it so reverse smoking usme question aata hai ki reverse smoking where is generally reverse smoking which site of the oral cavity leads to the formation of the carcinomatous transformation it is heart palate heart palate is more commonly caused by reverse smoking i hope you guys know what is reverse smoking when the lit end of the cigarette is actually placed inside the mouth that is called as reverse smoke is it clear if i ask you a simple question again between bd and cigarette smoking which contains more tobacco bd or cigarette it is not bd it is actually cigarette cigarettes contain more amount of tobacco well the reason why you guys think of bd then which is more harmful bd smoking or cigarette smoking <laughs> it is bd smoking bd smoking is more harmful or more risk of carcinomatous transformation but cigarette contain more tobacco now how can these two opposite things happen the reason is filtered tobacco in cigarettes we have filtered tobacco which is present whereas in bd smoking we have unfiltered tobacco and that is why the bd smoking is more harmful theek hai now another question now uh, all these questions you might be uh, thinking it they are all weird question but these are commonly asked which type of alcoholic drink which type of alcoholic drink among wine beer whiskey everything which alcoholic drink has got has been known to cause maximum respiratory cancer we have so many drinks isn't it hard drinks soft drinks or not the soft drinks i mean huh so whiskey no it is not the whiskey it is rather wine and beer wine and beer wine and beer are generally have been having increased risk of oral cancer okay is it clear yes it is wine good is it okay is this slide okay squamous cell carcinoma then this is what i have written remember if the question you have to go according to the question western population it is a tongue okay uh, in tongue which part of tongue dorsal ventral tip of the tongue lateral which part which part of tongue has got the maximum potential yes very good lateral border and to be more specific anterior two thirds of the lateral border of the tongue has got the maximum risk of carcinomatous transformation in either the western population theek okay? hai is it clear and remember smoking and drinking has got a synergistic effect okay one more thing can sunlight cause oral cancer can sunlight cause oral cancer yes or no no sunlight cannot cause oral cancer but yes that's what i was about to say for the carcinoma of the lips sunlight might be a bit disposing factor for the carcinomatous transformation theek okay? hai so is it clear skin cancer yes and uh, definitely skin cancer and carcinoma of the lower lips especially the lips among the lips also we need to say lower lip is having a better or a more malignant potential is it should we go on to the next question now just go through this question 10 question in an adult progressive increase in mandibular length and interdental spacing is a feature of we have these five choices obviously we can safely say choice c cannot be there isn't it a periodontitis will not result in interdental spacing we can also safely say what is cushing disease what is addison disease cushing is increased systemic steroid or increased amount of uh, cortisol 
secretion is called as Cushing's. Decrease is called as addition. So what is your best answer? Choice A or choice B? Just think about it. Addisons, no. In addison, there is definitely no increase in the mandibular length. It is either A or choice B. I have given you a lot of clues now, isn't it? <laughs> choice A? No, it is not choice A. We are left with choice B. Hyperpituitism. Okay? So it is hyperpituitism in which there is an increase of mandibular length. What is hyperpituitism commonly called as? Gigantism, isn't it? Gigantism and acromegaly. See the slide. Acromegaly. Can you see the slide? And acromegaly is when the epiphyses have been closed and then there is the growth is called as acromegaly. Acromegaly is more common and gigantism is pretty rare. In gigantism patients will go as high, as tall as 8 feet or 9 feet even. Very rare. In acromegaly, Remember, radiologically, I will give you two important points. Please write it down. I have not written it on a slide. In acromegaly, can you see the mandible? Can you make out the mandible? It's massive mandible. And this mandible is also called as, I am writing it down, lantern jaw. Lantern jaw. In acromegaly, the radiographically, the type of the mandible which is seen is called as lantern jaw. This is the first unique radiographic feature of acromegaly. The second common finding. Okay, I'll ask a simple physiology question. Where is the pituitary gland present? In the brain, where is the pituitary gland present? In which exact area of the brain? Or skull? Interior brain, okay. Which part of skull? Cella tersica, excellent. Cella tersica, okay. I'll just complete it. Cella tersica, okay. I'm writing it. Uh, sorry, it's a uh, wrong spelling mistake. T U, okay. There is an enlargement of cella tersica in patients with gigantism and acromegaly, okay. In patients with gigantism and acromegaly, there is enlargement of cella tersica. Okay, now one more question which has been asked, what is the lifespan of these patients of acromegaly and gigantism? The lifespan surprisingly of these patients is actually less as compared to normal individuals. Why? If there is a huge body, your blood needs to work double, isn't it? Your blood needs to pump more in order to ensure the blood goes to the far organs as compared to us normal persons. And an acromegalic person, he is having a huge body. So there is a cardiac overload and these patients generally die of heart attack. And their lifespan is generally around 40 to 45 years. So on the contrary to what we believe, an acromegaly or gerontism patient will be having a longer lifespan. It is actually the complete opposite. Is it clear? Now, this is what oral manifestations of hyperpituitarism or acromegaly or gigantism. Remember, please write these points. Thick lips, enlarged tongue and roots are much, much longer than normal and teeth are proportional to the size of the jaws and the rest of the body. In fact, there is a commonly, it is a question which is asked again and again that in these patients, how do you differentiate an acromegaly patient who is having in skeletal class 3? Obviously, isn't it? Skeletal class 3 over over in patients. Mein. How do you differentiate a skeletal class 3 from a patient with an acromegaly class 3? In a patient with acromegaly class 3, there will be enlarged tongue which keeps on pressing on the lower lip, on the lower front teeth and this causes spacing of the teeth. In patients with acromegaly class 3, there is an enlarged tongue. Is it clear to there? So when this acromegalic tongue keeps on pressing on the lower interior again and again, this causes protrusion of the lower incisors and this leads to spacing of the teeth. So this is how you differentiate an acromegalic teeth, acromegalic class 3 from a genetic or a skeletal class 3. Is it clear?
so these are the questions which are being asked again and again generally 11 question which one of the following is seen in primary herpetic stomatitis herpes simplex herpes zoster and varicella okay what is a macule macule kya hota hai a macule is a flat discoloration isn't it a papule is a raised raised swelling of around 1 cm in length raised okay vesicles well fluid filled areas are called as vesicle and pustules are pus filled areas so of these four choices which one is seen in primary herpetic herpangina herpes zoster varicella in all these conditions what do you think you can just think of this either macule or papule or vesicles or pustules correct it is vesicles it is vesicles so all in this vesicles are generally seen in viral infections now if i just ask you i'm just trying to be as specific as possible please try to remember aap sare viruses aapko yaad rahe na rahe but try to remember this virus always human herpes virus human herpes virus hhv family it's a massive family theek hai which has got sub types eight sub types hhv1 hhv2 hhv3 hhv4 5 6 7 8 as you can see in this slide hhv1 and hhv2 are just another names of hhv1 and hhv2 hhv3 is our varicella zoster virus theek hai hhv4 is epstein barr virus hhv5 is cytomegalo virus hhv6 has got no name hhv6 has got no name but it is known to cause a disease called as roseola infantum it is known to cause a disease called as roseola infantum in these patients theek hai hhv7 so far has not been known to cause any kind of disease in the human so far and hhv8 is causing with disease carpozy sarcoma theek hai now when i say hhv8 okay try to remember one fact always that a question keeps on being asked again and again carpozy sarcoma is caused by there are always two choices given carpozy sarcoma is caused by choice a epstein barr virus choice b hhv8 remember in the older books when you go through books which were written in the 90s and the early 2000 they will always say the answer as epstein barr virus but in actuality the correct answer is human herpes virus type 8 is it clear so this is a very very common thing which you guys need to remember it very well that hhv8 causes carpozy sarcoma not epstein barr virus in fact i will just ask another question slightly unrelated to it but it's a question which is commonly asked in carpozy sarcoma which is the commonest malignancy in the eighth patient okay which is the commonest malignancy in the eighth patient it is it a carpozy sarcoma or is it b non hn is it carpozy or nhn which is the commonest malignancy in eighth So what is the answer? Any answer? Carpozy's or initial? No, it is not Carpozy's. It is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, I will just repeat the question. Which is the non-Hodgkin lymphoma? Okay, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Between Carpozy sarcoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which is the commonest malignancy in aids patient it is not carpozy sarcoma it is rather non hodgkins lymphoma now in the older books again i will go in the older books they always used to say that carpozy sarcoma is the commonest type but gradually it came to be known that it is not carpozy sarcoma but rather non hodgkin lymphoma which is the commonest malignancy of the hiv patient Is it clear? Okay. So is it clear till here? HHV eight. So I will go on to the next virus. HHV seven does not cause anything. HHV six causes a disease. If you remember, I told you a disease called as 
Roseola infantum. Now, why did I use such a very difficult word? The reason why I told such a difficult word is because in Roseola infantum, there are oral ulcers in infants. Isn't it? Tabhi to naam hai, Roseola infantum. So, there are oral ulcers in the infants. That is why the name is Roseola infantum. That is what you should know about HHV6. So, do not go in detail about HHV6. HHV5, cytomegalovirus. Now, cytomegalovirus, HHV5, cytomegalovirus, this is causes a disease which is generally seen in HIV patients and that disease which is seen in the HIV patients is called as, can anyone of you tell me? Which one disease? <laughs> Parotid gland inclusion disease. Have you heard of this? Okay, koi baat nahi. Parotid gland inclusion disease is caused by HHV5 or cytomegalovirus. This is in fact the only thing which you guys need to know about HHV5. Okay? But now comes the more important viruses. HHV4 or Epstein-Barr virus. What are the diseases caused by Epstein-Barr virus? You can expect a lot of answers in this. HHV4, how many types of diseases are caused by HHV4 or Epstein-Barr virus? Can anyone of you tell me or write me? Which answer? It is oral hairy leukoplakia. Oral hairy leukoplakia. Then, in addition to HL, any other important disease? Infectious mononucleosis. In addition to this, OHL infectious mononucleosis and non Hodgkin lymphoma, NHL. OHL infectious mononucleosis, non Hodgkin lymphoma, and carcinoma of the nasopharynx. Epstein-Barr virus is in fact a very very important virus which is known to cause a lot of diseases. I am just writing 4 or 5 but even they say that Burkitt lymphoma is also caused by EBV. OHL, infectious mononucleosis, okay? OHL, infectious mononucleosis, carcinoma of the nasopharynx, okay? then what else? Carcinoma of nasopharynx, yeah, that's it. Burkitt lymphoma and NHL, Burkitt lymphoma, carcinoma of nasopharynx. All these diseases have been known to be caused by Epstein-Barr virus and infectious mononucleosis. Okay? Now, if I try to tell you about HHV1 and HHV2, human herpes virus 1 and human herpes virus 2, which is simply another name of HSV1 and HSV2. Okay, I remember I am not writing so far about HHV3. So I will just tell you about HHV1 and HHV2. This is again very elementary stuff, acute herpetic gingivus stomatitis. It occurs in age group of 6 months to 5 years. Why do you think this occurs in the age group of 6 months only? Why do you think it occurs in 6 months only? The reason why this occurs in the age group of 6 months only because if you remember correctly, when a baby comes on the world, he actually gets certain antibodies from his or her mother. And for how long these antibodies stay? That's good. Immunity. For how long these antibodies stay? For six months. That is why primary herpetic gingivus stomatitis will never ever be seen before six months. It will always be seen after six months. And when the child's immunity is very low till the age of five years, generally these are seen in lower socio-economic status. Okay? Now, the biggest oral manifestation of primary herpetic gingivus stomatitis, in fact, which is the hallmark of this primary herpetic gingivus stomatitis is that in primary herpetic gingivus stomatitis, which oral manifestation is one of the most unique oral manifestations. Yes, there are ulcers, there are this thing. The most unique oral manifestation is gingivitis. Chronic generalized marginal gingivitis is the hallmark 
of patients who are having acute herpetic gingivitis stomatitis theek hai in patients with primary herpetic gingivitis stomatitis we tend to come across certain unique findings and that unique finding is enlargement or massive enlargement of the gingiva and that is called as chronic generalized marginal gingivitis is it clear remember the gingivitis is not seen in abscess ulcer the gingivitis is not seen in herpangina the gingivitis is not seen in any other condition but it is only and only coexisting with the oral ulcers in the patients who are having primary herpetic gingival stomatitis is it clear to here theek hai now these are how a primary herpetic gingival stomatitis will be seen you can see certain ulcers on the tip of the tongue can you make out well these are the few things which might occur when you do not really treat the primary herpetic gingival stomatitis clearly this will lead to an aggravated condition of pharyngeal tonsillitis in which we have sore throat fever malaise headache in all these conditions are occurred now what are the mcqs which are commonly asked in patients with primary herpetic gingival stomatitis the questions that are commonly asked in patients with primary herpetic gingival stomatitis are when do we treat patients with primary herpetic gingival stomatitis how do we treat them can steroids be given in these patients or not can steroids be given in patients with herpetic gingival stomatitis or not yes or no it is no no you cannot never give patients steroids why remember they are occurring in children 6 months to age of 5 years so when you give the steroids to a patient this will lead to an Im reduced immunity and ultimately will affect the growth of the child so systemic steroids are never given in patients so what do we give we give the patient antivirals we give the patient antivirals in patients with herpetic gingival stomatitis and another question is generally asked again and again in antivirals which or what time during for how long can you give this antiviral can you a patient comes to you and he says he noticed these lesions 4 days back 5 days back 6 days back or he noticed it 2 days back can you give this to every patient no you cannot give a cyclovir or antiviral to every patient you need to specify a time limit duration and that time limit duration has been 72 hours 72 hours if the patient yes that that is also there when the patient has been diagnosed with a lesion for less than 72 hours antivirals would be successful but if a patient comes to you after 5 days whether you give or you don't give it really doesn't make any difference because this condition is simply self limiting this condition is self limiting is it clear so in this condition of the antivirals we generally come across these findings which antiviral again acyclovir which is given as 400 mg four times a day we give 400 mg four times a day now if you see the slide which is right now in front of you it is showing herpes labialis can you make out now what is herpes labialis how come herpes labialis has come well when the primary herpetic gingival stomatitis occurs this leads to certain ulcerations this leads to certain ulcerations now these certain ulcerations these certain ulcerations are occur these leads to virus being latent and when the virus becomes latent when the virus become latent now when the virus becomes latent this goes into the ganglion and when the patient's immunity comes down when the patient's immunity reduces this leads to reactivation of the virus and this reactivated virus ultimately results in the formation of certain lesions called as herpes labialis is it clear now the virus becomes latent and when this virus becomes latent <coughs> it ultimately results in when this virus becomes latent 
this ultimately results in the formation of an ulceration whenever our immunity due to any of these conditions we are having gastric upset and this generally happens in winter as a lot and that is why if you see the name carefully it is saying cold sore why is it saying cold sore simply because of the fact the patient is unable to generally have any kind of condition in this condition okay is it clear now now herpes labialis when this occurs on the lips but when this occurs inside the oral cavity this is how an herpes labialis will appear as this is how an herpes labialis will appear as herpetic vitlow when there is an infection of thumb or finger when you are wearing no gloves this is it is it clear now hhv1 and hhv2 i hope this is clear hhv1 and hhv2 now in hhv1 and hhv2 we have come across these viruses which are being very latent and causing infection and whenever they get activated they result in the formation of herpes labialis and when it occurs intra oral it is called as recurrent intra oral herpes now there are certain mcqs which have been asked again and again which of the two aphthous ulcers and herpes intra oral herpes which occurs in keratinized mucosa aphthous ulcers or herpes of the two condition which occurs in ulcers which occurs in keratinized mucosa aphthous ulcers or herpes aphthous no it is not aphthous and aphthous ulcers will occur on non keratinized mucosa whereas intra oral herpes will always occur on the keratinized mucosa what are the examples of keratinized mucosa attached gingiva and the lateral surface of the hard palate the lateral surface of the hard palate is generally seen in patients with this condition okay is it clear gingiva and lateral surface of hard palate now why did i come uh, what are canker sores what are canker sores we know what are cold sores cold sores are herpes labialis canker sores are your aphthous ulcers aphthous ulcers are also called as canker sores okay so this was about hhv1 and hhv2 now coming to hhv3 or also called as herpes zoster this photograph is actually of a skin and you can make out some lesions which are clustered on an erythematous base isn't it so this is actually herpes zoster is called by varicella zoster virus we said the chicken varicella zoster virus now this is generally seen in usually limited to one or two now the hallmark of herpes zoster this is how zoster cranial no why do you think i have shown this picture no why i have shown the this thing simply because as she has correctly written it it is an example of a unilateral lesion very good other after lesion if your lesion is unilateral it has to be herpes zoster if your lesion is bilateral or crossing the midline it i repeat it cannot be herpes zoster for a lesion to be diagnosed as herpes zoster it needs to be unilateral is it clear and why do you think i have drawn this diagram of the division of the nerve because the lesion always falls along the path of the trigeminal nerve okay when it falls along the path of the thalamic it is called as herpes ophthalmicus when it is occurring the path of maxillary nerve then it is called as maxillary division involvement when it is occurring on the mandibular then we call it as mandibular division of the three maxillary mandibular and ophthalmic which is the commonest type which is involved ophthalmic or maxillary or mandibular of the three types ophthalmic maxillary and mandibular which one is the most commonly involved it is actually ophthalmic we might think that it is maxillary but it is not ophthalmic it is rather the maxillary uh, ophthalmic one which is generally involved okay 
Well, uh, that was the answer of the vesicular eruption, herpes zoster. It is ophthalmic division. After ophthalmic, it comes maxillary. Now, during this discussion of herpes zoster, there is one very, very important slide which I, in fact, forgot to incorporate. That was of this particular terminology. Can you see this? What I have written? Ramsey Hunt syndrome. It is not Hunter syndrome. It is Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Okay. What is Ramsey Hunt syndrome? Well, the basically Ramsey Hunt syndrome is same as your herpes zoster, but which nerve is involved in this? Instead of trigeminal nerve, the nerve involvement is facial nerve. Okay. Facial nerve is involved, and very good. In facial nerve, uh, uh, when it is involved, it is called as Ramsey. Hunt syndrome. Okay. <clears throat> this is the next question. Twelve question. A patient is on broad spectrum antibiotics for four weeks. Presents with widespread sore, red, and white oral mucosal lesion. The most likely diagnosis is. What do you think it can be? Candidiasis, leukoplakia, erythema multiforme, erosive lichen planus, or pemphigoid. Choice A, candidiasis. Can it be erythema multiforme? You are absolutely correct. It is candidiasis, and the condition in which it is. I'm just writing it down. Antibiotics or more. So what I am trying to ask you is actually what is antibiotic sorbo? An antibiotic sorbo is when a patient takes broad spectrum antibiotics for a lot of duration of time. For a lot of duration of time, this leads to the presence of candidal infection in the mouth, and this is called as antibiotic sorbo. And if I ask you, antibiotic sorbo in technical language is called as which type of candidiasis? Erythematous or pseudomembranous or atrophic? Which type? Okay, one more question. In fact, I'm just sorry. Are erythematous or atrophic same or different? Are atrophic type of candidiasis same or different? See these pictures. Now this is an example of the erythematous candidiasis. As you can see the reddish area. Okay, atrophic and erythematous are actually the same. Okay, you have written it different, but they are actually same. Why they are same? The reason why the different word is seen in the book because simply because of the fact that atrophic candidiasis we use it when it is seen on the tongue, and erythematous when we see it on the palate. It's the same stuff which is generally seen. In the different areas, it is called by different name, but technically it is the same thing. Okay? Yes. When the papilla get degenerated, we just call it because there is a degeneration of papilla. So, in in the word, there is an atrophy of papilla, isn't it? So we call it as atrophic candidiasis. But when the same thing occurs on the palate, we call it as erythematous candidiasis. So it's the same stuff, but occurring in the different areas of the oral cavity. Is it clear? So what is antibiotic sore mouth? Is it atrophic candidiasis or pseudomembranous candidiasis? Is it atrophic and yes, it is atrophic candidiasis. And to be more accurate, it is actually acute atrophic acute atrophic candidiasis. What is thrush? What is thrush? Have you heard of thrush? Thrush is thrush is pseudomembranous candidiasis thrush is acute pseudomembranous candidiasis what is kissing lesion i'm just asking question regarding fungal infection what is kissing lesion kissing lesion is when the dorsum of tongue keeps on touching the hard palate and it ultimately leads to presence of an atrophic area on tongue as well as on the palate and this is called as kissing lesion so Kissing lesion is it also an example of atrophic candidiasis? Yes, but the difference is this will be called as chronic atrophic. 
Is it clear? So acute atrophic candidiasis and antibiotic or no? Acute pseudomembranous candidiasis is thrush. Chronic atrophic candidiasis is kissing lesion. And one more condition, dentist stomatitis. I will come. I will just deal with dentist stomatitis a little bit later. Okay? Is it clear till here? Okay. Now, one more thing which is very important for you regarding candidiasis. One question which keeps on being asked again and again, which is the most common fungal infection in the world, that is candidiasis. Is candidiasis? I will just say it slowly. Is candidiasis an example of a superficial fungal infection? Choice A. Choice B. Deep fungal infection or both of the above? Is it superficial fungal infection, deep fungal infection, or C? Both. Very good. It is both. It can be affected as superficially as well as as a deep fungal infection. In fact, it is the only fungal infection that can have both a superficial as well as a deep fungal infection involvement. What are the other examples of deep fungal infection? Histoplasmosis, plastomycosis, mucormycosis, zygomycosis. What are the other names which you know? All those are examples of deep fungal infection. Is it clear? But candidiasis represents the only condition which can be occurring as superficially as well as deep. If I just ask you, which is the only oral manifestation of all? Remember all these deep fungal infections which I just told you, blasto, muco, phyco. They all have just one oral manifestation. What is that oral manifestation? So just the one single oral manifestation they have. It is non-healing ulcer. All these fungal infections have got just one single oral manifestation of a non-healing oral ulcer. Is it clear? Uh, in HIV patients, which type of candidiasis is more common? A trophic type or pseudomembranous? In HIV patients, which type is more common? A trophic or pseudomembranous? This question keeps on or hyperplastic or angular colitis. If I give you four choices of these four types, which is the more common type? Atrophic, pseudomembranous, or angular colitis or hyperplastic? Is it pseudomembranous? No, it is not hyperplastic. It is atrophic candidiasis. Atrophic candidiasis is the most common type of fungal infection which is seen in HIV patients. But, but pseudomembranous candidal infection, if a patient is having pseudomembranous candidiasis infection, it actually indicates that the patient is having a high risk of AIDS. Okay? And pseudomembranous candidiasis infection represents deep fungal infection. A pseudomembranous candidiasis infection, uh, sorry, it represents a more poor immune status, whereas in atrophic candidiasis is more common in HIV patients. Is it clear? This type, coated tongue, it's an example of atrophic or pseudomembranous? Atrophic type. Okay? This is pseudomembranous type and this is median rhomboid glossitis. Candida. Now, one more question which I completely forgot about Candida. Is Candida occurring in one form or two forms? Candida actually occurs in two forms, yes. Both as hyphae as well as yeast form or filamentous form. It is the filamentous form of the Candida that causes the deep aggression of the Candida. Okay? Is it clear? Hyperplastic candidiasis. Now, Canada has got just one oral manifestation and that is burning sensation. But hyperplastic candidiasis is perhaps the only condition that has having a clinical feature of this feature, pain. Hyperplastic candidiasis represents pain. Okay? Whereas all the other examples of the infections, 
of the candidal infections, whether it is pseudomembranous, whether it is atrophic, whether it is angular gelitis, all of them have got just burning sensation. But hyperplastic candidiasis is a non-scrapable type. Remember, hyperplastic candidiasis is non-scrapable and pseudomembranous candidiasis is scrapable. Okay? Is it clear? Pseudomembranous candidiasis is scrapable, whereas hyperplastic is non-scrapable. And in fact, if I ask you, of all the subtypes of candidal infections, atrophic, pseudomembranous, hyperplastic, angular gelitis, which type has got a malignant potential? Which type? Is it atrophic? Is it hyperplastic? Is it pseudomembranous or is it angular gelitis? It is hyperplastic type. Okay? Hyperplastic type, correct. In hyperplastic candidiasis, there is a malignant potential. Now, if I just ask you certain questions about pre-malignant lesion, which pre-malignant lesion, okay, which pre-malignant lesion has got the highest malignant transformation rate? Which pre-malignant lesion has got the highest malignant transformation rate? What would be your answer? It is erythroplakia. 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 Which has got a massive malignant potential of 90%. 90%. Take okay? it. Okay. Yes. It is in, uh, not a red white lesion. It is in a completely red lesion. Take okay? it. After erythroplakia, which lesion has got the highest malignant potential? It is OSMF. What is the malignant potential of OSMF? It is 30%. Okay. What is the malignant potential of leukoplakia? What is the malignant potential of leukoplakia? Like in planners, one percent. What is the malignant potential of leukoplakia? No, it is four to six. 4 to 6 percent. 1 percent is the answer of oral lichen plans. Okay? These are the examples of the pre-malignant lesions like, oh sorry, OSMF is an example of condition, but I'm just telling you pre-malignant lesions where you have leukoplakia, aega, your erythroplakia will come, tobacco pouch keratosis will also come as pre-malignant lesion, actinic colitis, pre-malignant condition, we have lots of conditions, OSMF, plumber vincent syndrome and all these conditions are the hallmark of your pre-malignant condition. Zero derma pigmentosa. Have you heard of this? Zero derma pigmentosa. I'll just write it down. Zero derma pigmentosa. Is it clear? Should we go into the next slide? Should we go on? 13 question. Oral signs and symptoms of vitamin B2 deficiency may include. What do you think will be the answer? Glossitis, angular colitis, pain, erythematous oral mucosa. Generally in a patient with generally in a patient with multiple vitamin deficiency or any vitamin deficiency tongue will start showing some changes which will be called as glossitis there will be angular colitis pain will be there and erythematous oral mucosa so the correct answer is all one two three four are seen so the correct answer would be all of the above okay and when there is a deficiency of vitamin b2 we call it as a riboflavinosis which is characterized by glossitis atrophy of all these conditions okay so I'll just uh, I'll just give a very very quick precursor. I will not be boring you with what happens in vitamin B1 and all. I'll just be doing a very quick recap of what is vitamin B1. Vitamin B1 deficiency leads to very very. Okay, there are no other manifestations. So you guys no, don't need to worry about that. But what you guys need to know, vitamin B1 leads to very very. This is important. Okay. Riboflavin, vitamin B2. Deficiency manifestation, well, uh, it's, uh, we should not be going into all that stuff, but what we need to go is 
oral manifestation glossitis and oral manifestation angular colitis and dermatitis all these are the oral manifestations of vitamin b2 deficiency vitamin b3 niacin just remember the names please again and again okay vitamin b3 niacin no need to remember all this okay the one thing which you guys need to remember is pellagra vitamin b1 ki deficiency se hota hai aapka very very vitamin b2 ki deficiency se hota hai aapka a riboflavonoids vitamin b3 ki deficiency se pellagra well pellagra is important not only because of the fact ki three d's hai isme which are called as dermatitis diarrhea dementia which will lead to the 4d which is death okay the why we are so i mean worried about vitamin b3 is because there are mucous membrane lesions affecting which are the earliest diagnostic lesions of the disease okay the oral cavity lesions are the earliest diagnostic lesions but again this word which i have written in red is the reason why pellagra is important to us the tongue becomes completely depapulated and becomes bald okay it becomes completely depapulated and that is called as bald tongue of sandwich okay it is not sandwich it is sand with the patient complains of burning sensation obviously baat hai when we were there is a loss of papilla it's very very obvious that the patient will be having complete loss of papilla is it clear well uh, folic acid and vitamin b12 are also the same theek okay? hai so i'll just club them together even though then uh, folic acid is not exactly vitamin b12 well this is what happens in vitamin b12 deficiency there is no need for you to remember everything but what you guys need to remember is the word sensory disturbances there is nerve involvement or the nervous system involvement is there along with sensory disturbances theek okay? hai Now, why is vitamin B12 deficiency so important to us? Again, I have just helped in writing that it is a dull tongue, which is referred as hunter's glossitis and molar glossitis. And if you read the next line, it is similar to the dull tongue of the sandwich. Generally, vitamin deficiency is not very important to us as a dentist, but I am just writing to you. Both are the important one. Vitamin A, vitamin E are not really important to us. Okay. as oral manifestation but vitamin b is still important try to remember the names of the diseases ki vitamin b1 se ye ho raha hai vitamin b2 se ye ho raha hai b3 se ye ho raha hai and the oral manifestation b12 ki deficiency se aapka hunter glossitis and molar glossitis is happening whereas vitamin b3 or pellagra is leading to a disease which uh, pellagra is leading to bald tongue of sandwich is it clear now this is what happens oral mucosa exhibits the only the pale yellowish tint and administration i think i there is no need for me to say that we need to give vitamin b and folic acid generally hand in hand or together to these patients is it clear now next question which of the following requires antibiotic prophylaxis for a patient with a prostatic heart valve now this is a really tough question a tough in the sense a uh, clinically oriented subject which is your answer nerve block do we need to give nerve block no there is actually no need to give an antibiotic prophylaxis if you are giving only the nerve block but if you are doing a procedure which is likely to invade the bulb blood like extraction or endodontic instrumentation beyond the apex then we do require antibiotic prophylaxis there is no need in choices c and d there is absolutely no indication or no use of giving antibiotic prophylaxis theek okay? hai infective endocarditis i am just giving a very short precursor what are the mcqs all i will just be discussing that well uh, as you can very well see it's an example of a bacteremia it's a cardiac lesion with a turbulent blood flow and streptococcus viridans the reason why it is important to us as a dental practitioners is there is a streptococcus species and which can proliferate into the blood stream through the oral cavity infect the wall 
एंड दिस विल जनरली हैपन ए मंथ आफ्टर डेंटल प्रोसीजर ठीक है नाउ दीज आर द कंडीशन ऑफ द हार्ट इन विच एंडो कैरेटिस प्रोफ्लेक्सेस इज रिकमेंडेड आई हैव ट्राइड टू कट इट डाउन बट ऑफ ऑल दीज आई विल जस्ट आस्क यू सम क्वेश्चन सपोज इफ द पेशेंट इज हैविंग ए पेस मेकर इफ ए पेशेंट इज हैविंग ए पेस मेकर विल यू गिव एंडो कैरेटिस प्रोफ्लेक्सेस और नॉट For a prosthetic heart valve, yes. But what about a pacemaker? Very good. Yes. We do not. I mean, no is the correct answer. There is no need to give a patient antibiotic prophylaxis if he is having a pacemaker. But if he is having a previous history of some prosthetic heart valve, and most importantly, congenital heart disease or all these conditions, mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation, we need to give. Antibiotic prophylaxis is it clear? In which procedures it is not recommended? When there is a surgical repair, coronary artery bypass, graft surgery. This question has been asked again and again. Pacemaker has been asked again and again, and coronary artery bypass. A patient who comes to you and says that my CABG is gone, coronary artery bypass, graft surgery is done. There. More than six weeks, there is absolutely uh, no. It, even my Canadian guidelines, we do. It is. I don't think even my Canadian guidelines it should be there. I don't think uh, for a patient with pacemaker we need to give antibiotic prophylaxis. Okay, there is no need to give an antibiotic prophylaxis in a patient who is having anti. Yeah. Yes. these guidelines are according to the canadian army in fact they are actually been given by the american heart association which have been incorporated and which are followed throughout the world so endocarditis prophylaxis is not recommended in all these procedures okay i hope this is clear dental considerations now in what are the procedures we require endocarditis prophylaxis for extractions for periodontal probing and remember placement of orthodontic bands if the question is orthodontic bracket there is absolutely no need for orthodontic bracket there is absolutely no need to give antibiotic prophylaxis but if you are giving if you are giving orthodontic band you need to give this kind of antibiotic prophylaxis for a root canal treatment For a nerve block, no need. But for an intraligamentary injection, definitely we require antibiotic prophylaxis. And recently, implant also they have started asking questions. Even for implant also, we need to give antibiotic prophylaxis. Okay? The procedures not requiring prophylaxis are obviously this: radiographs, rubber dam, impression, suture removal, orthodontic appliance adjustment, intracanal, endodontic procedures. In all these procedures, we do not give antibiotic prophylaxis. So what are the antibiotics that are actually given? This is amoxicillin, two grams one hour before the procedures. In an adult who is allergic to penicillin, we can give six hundred milligrams clindamycin or erythromycin also five hundred milligrams one hour before the procedure. In a children, fifty milligrams per kg amoxicillin one hour before the procedure. When in children who are allergic to penicillin, 20 milligram per kg. So if I ask you, in a 30 kg patient, in 30 kg children, how much will be the amount of the amoxicillin which we need to give? 30 kg. If the correct answer will be 1.5 gram. But what if the child child's weight is crossing 30? Suppose a patient have come, children come to you with a weight of 34 kgs. How much you will give them? Will you give 1.7? no if the child's weight is till 30 kg if the child's weight is 30 kg we will give 50 mg per kg but the moment the child's weight becomes more than 30 kg we need to give we need to start treating him like an adult and we will give him 2 grams of amoxicillin one hour before the procedure is it clear the moment the weight increases to more than 30 we will give the child 2 grams amoxicillin one hour before the procedure is it clear about prophylaxis 
I will just ask one more question about antibiotic prophylaxis. Suppose a patient, you have given an appointment of his extraction at 10 o'clock. Okay? Suppose you had given an extraction appointment at 10 o'clock and the patient took an antibiotic of amoxicillin 2 grams one hour before the procedure. But because of any XYZ reason, he comes to you instead of 10 at around 11 o'clock. What will you do? I will repeat the question slowly. You gave an appointment to a patient for an extraction at 10 o'clock. Okay. Then you told the patient to take his amoxicillin 2 grams at 9 o'clock, that is 1 hour before the procedure. But due to any unforeseen circumstances, the patient reaches at 11 in the morning. Okay? That is not at the scheduled time. What will you do? Will you do the procedure or will you re-give the amoxicillin again? Is it clear? You guys understood the question? So will you re-give? Yes. You will again give the patient another antibiotic and then tell the patient to wait for one hour again. Okay? So if a patient has reached at 11 o'clock, you will again give the amoxicillin and then you will tell him to wait outside and then you will do the procedure at around 12 o'clock. Is it clear? So absolutely right. When the patient comes late, you will again give him amoxicillin. So we'll go on to the next question. Which of the following is necessary to make a diagnosis of an OKC? Aspiration, exfoliative cytology, radiographic examination, and histological examination. Of all these four, which is the best answer? Histological examination, perfect. You are absolutely right. Uh, aspiration is not a bad choice. You can do an aspiration, but the problem is aspiration will not be very 100% uh, confirmatory. Exfoliative cytology will be not at all conclusive. Whereas radiographic examination will give you a multilocular appearance, but will not really help you. So the best way of diagnosing would be through in doing a biopsy and as you have written correctly, <coughs> the lining epithelium is very much characteristic. The uniformity or the thickness of the epithelium would generally be between 6 to 10 cells in depth without retipic formation. OKC represents 11% of the jaw cyst. And remember, OKC represents one of the very, very few orondogenic cysts that occurs both as unilocular as well as multilocular. Okay? OKC occurs both as unilocular as well as multilocular. This is a radiographic examination. This is an example of a unilocular lesion, but multilocular lesion is an example of OKC. In fact, OKC represents one of the very few conditions that grows in an anterior posterior direction. That grows in an anterior posterior direction. That is, there will be no buccal or lingual cortical plate expansion. There will be no buccal or lingual cortical plate expansion and thus OKC will tend to grow along the mandible. If you can see me, I just shown you, I'm just showing you my hands. These hands are there. This hand represents the buccal wall, this hand represents the lingual wall. So if the cyst is growing in between, instead of growing it normally buccal and causing expansion, this will be growing in an interior posterior direction like this. So what will happen is the buccal and the lingual plate will remain intact. There will be no expansion like this. But the cyst will be growing like this. So that is it will be growing in an interior posterior direction. This is the hallmark of odontogenic keratosis. Is it clear? The obviously water, there will be no swelling. So when you see the patient, there will be no swelling like this, but the massive radio latency will be there. I am sure in this patient, there would have been no swelling or very minimal swelling. Well, histology, again, thin epithelial lining, as you can see this, very thin epithelium with 6 to 10 layers, which are very much evident in this patient. Is it clear?
16 question in x ray equipment kilo voltage controls what does kilo voltage actually controls does kilo voltage control contrast yes speed of electrons even the speed of electron is indirectly controlled by kvp amount of radiation it does causes a very small increase in the radiation but very minuscule to be actually be counted penetrating power obviously what does a penetrating power of radiation depends on density and the speed and the kilo voltage so it also depends on the penetrating power of the radiation but does it depend on the temperature of the cathode filament remember kvp has got absolutely no connection with your filament it is used for creating a potential difference between cathode and anode so there will be absolutely no effect on the cathode filament change temperature so the correct answer will be contrast speed of electrons and the penetrating power of the radiation so the correct answer is choice either b or d so what should be the answer speed of electrons hogi effect ke nahi speed of electrons will be affected as i told you isn't it so there will be very small and then inconspicuous increase but the speed will be increased and remember einstein's formula e is equal to mc square in this formula what happens is as the speed increases the energy also increases so kvp indirectly leads to increase of the energy also okay as i told you x rays of higher energy will be having lesser wavelength or longer wavelength lesser wavelength remember and thus higher penetration and x rays of good energy are also called as hard x rays hard x rays theek okay? hai good 17 question the depth of penetration of any object by x rays the depth of penetration is determined by we have all all these four choices milliampereage does milliampereage causes any effect on the depth absolutely no milliampereage what milliampereage will do is it will just help us in increasing the density but not much what about the density of object yes the density of object will have a mild but definite effect on the penetration i'll just give an example you have enamel you have pulp don't you think the penetration would be affected in a pulp the blood supply the radiograph will easily pass through but in enamel the x rays will not pass through exposure time again has got absolutely no connection with it kilo voltage as i just told you in the last previous question only it does have an effect on the penetration so we are left with choices 2 and choice 4 so the correct answer is choice c okay image sharpness image sharpness of the radiographs can be improved by well we have all these four choices increasing the object film distance using a larger focal spot well using a larger diaphragm opening increasing the target film distance <coughs> so what will be your answer in this object film distance should be how should be a focal spot be there small or large a focal spot should ideally be as small as possible isn't it what about the distance between the focal spot and the object it should always be increased the more is the distance the more, lesser is the amount of image unsharpness increasing the distance between the focal spot and the object minimize the distance between the object and the film remember the film should be placed as close to the object as much as possible and whereas your x ray source should be as away from the tooth as much as possible so what will be your answer now i have given you all the hints now so now try to think which will be the better answer now of the four choices a b c d increasing the object film distance definitely no we will be decreasing the object film distance so it cannot be the answer a focal spot should be as less as possible and diaphragm opening doesn't really make any difference so the best answer is 
increasing the target film distance i'll just show you again increasing the distance between the focal spot and the object okay target is the same stuff only focal spot and the object so the correct answer is choice t is it clear so image sharpness can be increased by using like i told you all these condition minimize the distance increase the distance use as small as an effective focal spot as possible 19th the radiographic change most suggestive of multiple myeloma is now this is a very i would say very standard question <clears throat> no bone alteration punched out radiolysis lesions multiple radio opaque lesions diffuse ground glass appearance generalized hypersemantosis generalized hypersemantosis is seen in pager disease ground glass appearance is seen in fibrous dysplasia and hyperparathyroidism so we are left with choices a b c so what is your answer is there a bone alteration in this or not so what happens in multiple myeloma okay i'll just this is an image of multiple myeloma can you make out sharp radiolysis which are present in the lateral skull and we have certain radiolysis which are again the trademark we have multiple punched out radiolysis so it's a very standard answer choice b so remember the word multiple punched out radiolysis lesion come your answer without any doubt should be multiple punched out radiolysis lesion remember the choice e generalized hypersemantosis is seen in paget disease try to remember this generalized hypersemantosis is seen in paget disease generalized widening of pedonteal ligament space is seen in generalized widening of pedonteal ligament space is seen in scleroderma scleroderma generalized widening of pedonteal ligament space is seen in scleroderma multiple punched out radiolysis are seen in multiple myeloma generalized hypersemantosis is seen in paget disease theek hai scleroderma is it clear generalized widening of pdl next question which of the following tissues is least sensitive to ionizing radiation we have four choices in front of us enamel oral mucosa salivary gland bone yes it's a very easy answer enamel isn't it so well i'll just very briefly i will just tell you i'll not be taking much time well the moment an x ray strikes our body two things happen direct effect and indirect effect the radiation as you can see the yellow mark it strikes the molecule of rh it causes the formation of a radical isn't it when this radical is formed it will either combine with another radical to form a genetically altered molecule and it will degrade to form another molecule with another radical is it clear direct effect and the second one is water radiolysis there will be ionization of water molecule our body is made up of 70% of water so which will be more direct effect or indirect effect obviously indirect effect and indirect effect indirect effect will be having 66 66% sorry 66% of effects are indirect water as you can see there is ionization of water leading to the formation of radical and ultimately these radicals cause damage of the oral mucosa theek hai so ultimately what happens is there is a formation of hydroperoxyl radical and remember why are certain tumors radio sensitive and why are certain tumors radio resistant it is only and only because of hydrogen peroxy radical and hydrogen peroxide whenever there is a formation of hydrogen peroxide it will cause damage and lead to the formation of a radio sensitive tumor theek hai so can you anyone of you tell me is amyloblastoma is amyloblastoma an example of a radio sensitive or radio resistant is amyloblastoma radio sensitive or radio resistant this question is asked again and again yes very good amyloblastoma is radio resistant 
fibrous dysplasia is radio resistant cherubism is radio resistant salivary gland tumors are radio resistant is squamous cell carcinoma radio sensitive or not is oral cancer radio sensitive or not yes oral cancer is radio sensitive yes squamous cell carcinoma is radio sensitive that is why we do radiation therapy isn't it otherwise why would we be doing radiation therapy if oral cancer is not radiation resistant isn't it so radiation sensitivity in the cell type well i'll just say that these are the different types depending on the type of the radiation different cell types have got different more sensitive are these high mitotic index cells undergo many future mitoses they are most primitive in differentiation theek okay? hai uh, well these are the classification uh, well uh, i will always tell you one thing if you know this classification if you know this classification i promise you you guys can write or be able to always and always make out which is a radio sensitive cell which is not if you follow and listen to me carefully right now you can easily understand it vegetative intramitotic cells differentiating multipotential reverting post mitotic fixed post mitotic stem cells stem cells are examples of vegetative intramitotic cells it means all the cells all the stem cells which are there are all the examples of the most radio sensitive cells and their example is spermatogenic erythroblastic series and basal cells of the oral mucosa spermatogenic erythroblastic series and basal cells of the oral mucosa are the examples of the most radio sensitive cells okay is it clear about vegetative intramitotic in other words what i am trying to tell you vegetative intramitotic cell is the example of the most radio sensitive cell theek okay? hai then the second one is differentiating intramitotic cell they are less sensitive than stem cell they why because they can divide less frequently and they have the same differentiation example is inner enamel epithelium spermatocytes oocytes hematopoietic lineage what do you mean by hematopoietic lineage all the cells which are coming in the intermediate part of the hematopoietic series are called as hematopoietic cells even the lymphopoietic also will come in this so vegetative intramitotic are the most radio sensitive followed by differentiating and gradually multipotential connective tissue cells they are having moderate sensitivity so they are even less than the previous two group theek okay? hai please listen to it carefully then you can easily remember this endothelial cells fibroblasts mesenchymal cells all are examples of intermediate radio sensitive okay examples are again endothelial cells or the parenchymal and the ductal cells of thyroid kidney lungs liver all are examples of this group then the fourth group is reverting basically why is the cell radio sensitive simply because of the fact that it can be able to divide if it cannot divide obviously it becomes radio resistant the cells that are resistant because they cannot replicate they can multiply only in emergency so these are the few examples salivary gland duct cells liver kidney and thyroid cells especially the parenchymal part and the last group which is the most radio resistant part is the fixed post mitotic group fixed post mitotic cells they can never divide in ke examples are neurons muscles and optic lens so now you can easily tell me which are having high radio sensitivity remember all those cells which are having a very good radio sensitivity will be there lymphoid tissue bone marrow genital and the gonadal organs intestine mucosa all are having high radio sensitivity moderate obviously the group which is coming in the second and the third group this becomes moderate type blood vessels growing cartilage growing bone salivary gland lungs liver kidney and low lens means optic lens mature erythrocyte muscle cells neurons so if i ask you erythroblast and erythrocyte which is more radio sensitive erythroblast or erythrocyte which will be the answer blast very good it will be erythroblast because the word blast actually means stem cells the word blast means stem cells so erythrocyte is a fully mature erythrocyte 
so any blast whether it is chondroblast osteoblast we are actually asking you about stem cells is it clear and if i ask you inferior alveolar nerve is it radio resistant or not then it becomes radio resistant why because in example of a nerve muscle any muscle we can give an example temporalis hyoid any muscle any diaphragm muscle any sternocleidomastoid mesenteric temporalis lateral pterygoid all of them comes under muscle cell so these are an example of radio resistant cells is it clear so if you know this classification which i had just told you vegetative intermitotic differentiating intermitotic you can easily answer all the questions and few doubts which always creep in is it clear so we go on to the next slide now following in front of you is a cell cycle m g1 s g2 which cell cycle stage is the most radio sensitive stage which phase is the most radio sensitive m g1 s or g2 m it is not the m phase it is rather the g2 phase the g2 phase is the most radio sensitive state and which is the most radio resistant state it is s phase okay g2 phase is the most radio sensitive and s phase is the most radio resistant so which one of the following is the most common tumor of the salivary glands the most common tumor of the salivary glands of all these four types is actually pleomorphic adenoma as you have correctly written it is pleomorphic adenoma among all the types of salivary gland tumors pleomorphic adenoma is the commonest tumor which is the commonest tumor of the salivary gland in children in children it is pleomorphic adenoma but mucoepidermoid carcinoma is the most common example of the malignant tumor in children okay which is the most common malignant tumor of the salivary glands in adults which is the most common malignant tumor of the adults of the salivary glands in adults yes very good it is adenoid cystic carcinoma adenoid cystic carcinoma is the most common example salivary gland malignancy in the adult whereas in children it becomes mucoepidermoid carcinoma okay like i have written common salivary gland malignant tumor is mucoepidermoid carcinoma this is how a pleomorphic adenoma appears as extraorally and intraorally a swelling called as dumbbell shape is also sometimes seen in this but remember pleomorphic adenoma generally affects parotid gland most commonly very rarely it will affect your submandibular or sublingual glands what will be the answer of this question 22nd a patient who comes to you with a pain fever and unilateral parotid swelling following a ga most likely has very good why not mums well the most commonly students get to think that mumps is the answer but remember it is not the mumps because mumps is generally bilateral that's true and moreover very clearly in the question it is written following a general anesthesia so when a patient is taking a general anesthesia and has a history of taking general anesthesia the patient immunity has become less and this has resulted in the formation of sialadenitis okay as i have written uh sialadenitis is more common in parotid gland or some mandibular gland sialadenitis which gland is it parotid or some mandibular no sialadenitis is more common in parotid gland but sialolithiasis is more common in some mandibular gland okay so that's the main difference it causes a considerable amount of confusion sialolithiasis is more common in some mandibular gland whereas Sialadenitis is more common in parotid gland. This is one very basic difference, which you guys please remember it. This is how a sialadenitis appears as the yellowish tint, which you can see, is actually an amount of pus discharge, and the reddish area is an uh, indication of the inflammation. 
Silolithiasis, how is silolithiasis appear? As you can see in the diagram, it is appearing in the submandibular gland. As you can see, the prevalence 80% is submandibular gland, 6% parotid, 2% sublingual, and the remaining 12%, well, that accounts for minor salivary glands. Uh, well, silolithiasis is an example of idiopathic type of calcius growth. Idiopathic, unknown. Most common radiograph again occlusion. Well, uh, just a very short slide. Mumps virus, it's important caused by paramyxovirus RNA. Just remember this point. And what I would like you to remember is, uh, generally all of us think that mumps is bilateral, but mumps can also be unilateral. That is why I have specifically written this. Okay. So please try to remember. Mums, 99% would be bilateral, but very rarely it can also be unilateral. And it's a very self-limited swelling, but the most commonly, the question which is asked is complication, which is the commonest complication of the mums. The correct answer is sterility or infertility in males, or to be more specific, orchitis. Remember this, this is a very, very, very important question. Orchitis in post-pubertal males is one of the most commonest type of complication which is seen in patients with mumps. Is it clear? Should we go on to the next question now? 23rd. Which disorder presents with all permanent teeth exhibiting bulbous crown, cervical constriction and obliterated pulp canals and chambers? So what will be the answer in this? Very good. It is dentinogenesis imperfecta. Why dent how do you differentiate dentinogenesis from amelogenesis? Because of the last line in the question, obliterated pulp canal. The moment there is an obliteration of the pulp canal and the chambers, our answer becomes pretty straightforward. And in fact, that is the only way we can differentiate choice A and choice B. That is amelogenesis and dentinogenesis imperfecta. Okay? Well, dentine dysplasia, I am just writing you the important stuff. Dentine dysplasia, well, type 1, it is of two types, type 1 and type 2. Dentine dysplasia, type 1, there is rootless teeth. As you can see classically in this presentation, periabical radiolucency obviously ho jayega. And if you can make out, there is a fingernail crimp like radiolucency, which is again the hallmark of dentine dysplasia type 1. Okay? In dentine dysplasia type 1, there is rootless tooth, periapical radiolucency, and fingernail crimp like radiolucency. In addition to this, we have this kind of appearance in dentine dysplasia type 1. Can you make out? We have multiple teeth involvement. The roots are almost missing or rootless. Roots are generally very dwarf or they are not there. But dentine dysplasia is generally a very rare condition. So diagnosing it is actually not very easy as it sounds like. And as you can see, it gives an histopathological appearance of lava lava flowing around the boulders. Can you make out? The histopathological appearance would be lava flowing around the boulders. Dentine dysplasia type 2. Well, thistle tube or flame sharp pulp chambers. The word flame is actually missing. Flame shaped pulp chambers. Remember in dysplasia, dentine dysplasia type 2 it's there. In type 1 there is rootless teeth. But in type 2 the roots are present. Is it clear about dentine dysplasia? Okay, should we go on? Any doubt? What do you think this condition is? Is it amelogenesis, dentinogenesis, amelogenesis, dentinogenesis? What is this? Or none of the above? What do you think this OPG is actually representing? In fact, I have detailed it to ensure that you can e easily make out which condition I am talking about. No? 
dysplasia no if you can make out you cannot see neither enamel nor the dentine so i'll just give you a hint this is ghost teeth in which condition do you see ghost teeth in which dental anomaly condition you see ghost teeth it is regional odonto dysplasia this condition is an example of a regional odonto dysplasia is it clear now so i tell you breaky i place this opg so you guys can make out the difference between all these dental anomaly condition how is amelogenesis appearing how is dentinogenesis dentine dysplasia type 1 type 2 and how does regional odonto dysplasia is appearing is it clear so should we go on to the next question now any doubt okay 24 dentigrass cysts are usually found this is very easy question periapically periformally or interradicularly or mid tooth so what will be the answer for this this is a pretty easy question uh periapically or is it pericoronally remember dentigrass cyst is an example of pericoronal radiolucency so the correct answer is it is actually pericoronal okay it is not periapical and remember i had asked you question right at the beginning which is the most common odontogenic cyst well radicular cyst is an example of the most yes correct it is formed instead of the radicular cyst is the most common example of your odontogenic cyst but if you are asked most common developmental cyst it becomes your dentigrass cyst which is also known as follicular cyst theek okay? hai which what is the biggest complication of the dentigrass cyst biggest complication the biggest complication for okc was the problem was it was okc was recurrent but for the biggest complication for the dentigrass cyst would be amyloblastoma and what is it amyloblastoma called as mural amyloblastoma the amyloblastoma that is formed from a dentigrass cyst is called as mural amyloblastoma recurrent rate is negligible but the biggest complication is it results in the formation of amyloblastoma and that amyloblastoma is called as intramural or mural amyloblastoma radiographically dentigrass cyst is of three types right it is follicular type circumferential type and the lateral type what do you think this opg is representing which type of dentigrass cyst central circumfer central is also called as follicular only is it circumferential or lateral which type of dentigrass cyst is this lateral it is not circumferential because in the circumferential is almost like a donut theek okay? hai the tooth will be completely be immersed in dust but this is an example of a lateral type of dentigrass cyst if you see it carefully had the radiolucency been pushed a little bit more behind we could have called it as a circumferential but this is an example of lateral dentigrass cyst okay uh, well uh, you had just written uh, formed instead of tooth well the, what you are trying to say is for primordial cyst ठीक है, that is an example of the primordial cyst when the cyst is formed instead of tooth. Dentigrass cyst, as the name says, denti stands for tooth and gira stands for bearing. So it's an example of a tooth bearing cyst. So if there is no impacted tooth, it can never be diagnosed as a dentigrass cyst. Can you make out? Is it clear? So between periapical and pericoronal, it is pericoronal. next question which of the following will increase the image sharpness on the radiograph well uh, indirectly we have covered this question a few minutes ago so what would be your answer how do we like our focal spot to be as small or as large as possible small isn't it long source to film distance is it required or not yes short object to film distance is also required so the correct answer is choice d 
all of the above. It's a pretty easy question, I think. So next question, 26. Overlap, interproximal contacts in a bite-wing radiograph are due to improper collimator. Now, what do you think will be the answer? It doesn't mean only bite-wing only. It can be occurring in any area. Perfectly right. It is horizontal angulation. Whenever there is an improper horizontal angulation, it will always lead to overlapping of the teeth. And when there is improper vertical angulation, when the vertical angulation is increased, it causes foreshortening. When the vertical angulation is less, it causes elongation. What is the angulation for a bite plane generally? How much angle you keep for bite plane? Plus 5, plus 10, plus 15, plus 20, plus 30. How much? It is 10, plus 10. For a bite, yes, very good, plus 10. Next question, the microscopic appearance of the central gensal granuloma of the jaw is similar to that of lesions which occur in, so indirectly what we are asking you is, in which other condition do central gensal granuloma appears as radiographically similar to, or histopathologically similar to, either of these four conditions. Hyperparathyroidism, PJ disease, cleidocranial, hyperpituitism. Well, the central gensal granuloma, it is a benign process, unknown etiology. Okay? Just remember these two lines. Now, what is important for you guys is it occurs in interior mandible. Central gensal of all these slides, of all these central gensal, Interior mandible, okay, females and young children. So completely opposite of what we see in the other conditions. All the orogenic tumors are occurring in posterior mandible, but central gensal granuloma occurs in interior mandible, and females are more frequently males and children. Histological feature, well, uh, it consists of this: we have a proliferation of fibroblast and we have giant multinucleated giant cells. The light microscopic is identical to that of the brown tumor of hyperparathyroidism. So what is your answer then? So what is your answer? It is A, B, C, D, which one? No? Choice A, very good. Hyperparathyroidism. In hyperparathyroidism, we tend to see central giant cell granuloma. So, what about this unilateral premature eruption of teeth is characteristic of? Again, a very easy question. But then, unilateral word comes, we start thinking of two things only. Hemi, obviously one half. But is it hypertrophy or atrophy? Now, that is what you guys need to think about. Obviously, it cannot be acromegaly, it cannot be cleidocranial, it cannot be adrenogenital syndrome. So, we are left with choices B and C. Which is the answer? A hemi hypertrophy or hemi atrophy? Very good. It is hemi hypertrophy. In the case of hemi hypertrophy, we do have unilateral premature eruption of the teeth. The dentition is affected in all the three respects crown size, root size, and rate of development is also affected. I just have this particular slide which you can see. One side is having premature eruption of the teeth. There is a swelling in the CT scan and even in the PS skull, CT scan 3D, there is a very mild amount of enlargement. Again, it's, I, you guys might not be able to appreciate it, but this is very, very clearly and legibly seen in this condition. Is it clear? Should we go on to the next slide? Yes. Cleidocranial, well, uh, there is Midline meeting with the shoulders, bifid ribs are there, okay. Then we have all these conditions. Cleidocranial dysostosis, as I told you, cotton wool appearance is the hallmark of cleidocranial dysostosis. In addition to this, we have something called as bulb like skull. Bulb like skull is seen in patients with cleidocranial dysostosis. In patients with cleidocranial dysostosis, we have bulb-like skull which is seen. If you see this PA, doesn't it remind you of a light bulb? 
not a sea of a light bulb <laughs> it is actually resembling a light bulb like skull in which the inner part is almost fitting into the socket and the upper part is becoming broadening out so this is an appearance of a light bulb like skull again seen in pedocranial which is having another common appearance of cotton wool appearance and as you can see cleidocranial means multiple retained teeth multiple impacted teeth and you have another very very huge feature of this generalized loss of cementum generalized loss of cementum is seen in patients with this condition okay cleidocranial generalized widening of pdl is seen in scleroderma generalized hypercementosis is seen in paget disease so try to remember these three generalized generalized loss of cementum occurring in <coughs> sorry cleidocranial generalized widening of pdl in scleroderma generalized hypercementosis is seen in paget disease is it clear 29 question which of the following will not be found the word is not so what do you think is the answer don't in a hurry very good it is choice a remember in hyperparathyroidism we come across altered bone pattern we come across generalized loss of lamina dura as i have been telling you giant cell tumors of the bone and only feature which is not seen as hyperphysia the gingiva is not at all affected and all these conditions are also seen osteitis fibrosa cystica brown tumors all these features are also seen in these patients uh well uh, just a very quick recap i will not be taking much time of this three types of hyperparathyroidism is there which is the commonest type it is secondary type remember it is not primary it is secondary type of hyperparathyroidism is the commonest type in the primary type adenoma is the commonest secondary type is the commonest of the three okay and among the primary the primary can occur through either of these reasons carcinoma adenoma or hyperplasia adenoma is the commonest and tertiary is the rarest less than 0.1% 99% is secondary 0.9% is primary and 0.1% is tertiary okay uh well again very thing uh how does this occur simply because reduced calcium levels and why do reduced calcium levels occur because of any of these reasons either a transplant or dialysis or inadequate dietary intake all these results in reduced levels of vitamin d and ultimately what happens when there is a reduced calcium level due to it the calcium is excreted from the bone and ultimately it causes hyperparathyroidism i hope this is not very confusing okay i am trying to make it as simple and logical as possible okay uh just just take a second to go through this advanced stage of kidney disease kidney cannot excrete a phosphate level results in hyperphosphatemia and low level stimulate the secretion and this is secondary hyperparathyroidism how does secondary hyperparathyroidism occur it's because of entire this process is it clear advanced stage of kidney destruction ultimately causes reduced levels and stimulate the secretion of parathormone and ultimately causes parathormone activation resulting in secondary hyperparathyroidism okay 30th it is possible to misdiagnose the midline parietal suture as a so what do you think you can misdiagnose it as how does a midline parietal suture generally appears as it appears as a radiolucent yes it appears as a wavy radiolucent area do you think a cyst will appear like this it is fracture <coughs> a fracture would appear like <coughs> this correct this is how a median parietal suture appear as and this is how a fracture line would also appear as radiographically okay so maxilla will be all guys know what is intramaxillary suture i'm not going in that detail well i think all of you guys know it so i'm not going in detail do you want me to go in detail about this no need the median suture okay 
next question the proper collimation of the useful x ray beam for the film size and the target film distance will reduce first image definition scatter radiation radiographic contrast patient dose so just think about this what would be your answer well when we place a collimator what happens remember a collimator is made up of lead isn't it <laughs> well this is how a collimator is placed off it results in the formation of this and ultimately what does the collimator do the collimator is actually ensuring the prevention of scatter radiation isn't it and also ensuring that the patient when we reduce the scatter radiation what do we actually help in we also reduce in the revision reduce patient dose so ultimately what will happen is we are left with choice c is it clear collimator well uh, there are lots of types of collimators but we, what you guys need to remember is rectangular collimator rectangular collimator is the best type of the collimator remember there are three types tubular diaphragm and rectangular of the three types the rectangular collimator is the best type of collimator which exists and causes in reduced patient exposure of 60% this is our rectangular collimator i'm just uh, just have a look so that might be you can remember how does a rectangular collimator appears as okay uh this is how a radiation protection depends on well you use thyroid collars we use lead aprons we use lead protection lead protection barriers okay thyroid collar ko use karne se kitna percent kam hota hai 94% lead apron ko use karne se 98% by 98% lead apron ko use karne se remove hota hai collimator ko use karne se 60% filter ko use karne se 30% okay i will repeat the values again thyroid collar causes a reduced patient exposure of 94% lead apron causes 98% lead protection or lead barrier is placed collimation causes 60% especially rectangular filter causes 35 to 40% theek hai is it clear should we go on to the next part fine fine lead barrier uh, lead barrier has got no percentage as such but it is just placed uh, to ensure that no radiation passes through there is no as such fixed percentage wise of the lead barrier 33 very easy question i think you can you can just solve it in a few seconds only what's the answer of this genital tubercle the seen in the anterior mandible almost in the area of symphysis menti so the correct answer is occlusal radiography isn't it very easy question i don't think there requires much of an uh, discussion okay 34 this question is okay not very tough which syndrome has got multiple cysts of the jaw remember in gardner syndrome we had multiple osteomas multiple polyps multiple cutomas and all that stuff and multiple supernumerities multiple polyps so definitely it's not gardner isn't it <laughs> so what the best answer very good it is gorlin gott syndrome so what happens in gorlin gott syndrome it is also known as jaw cyst basal cell nevus bifid rib syndrome jaw cyst basal cell nevus bifid rib syndrome in which there are cutaneous anomalies like all these stuff dental and osseous anomalies i'll just show you in this patient can you make out multiple basal cell carcinomas multiple basal cell carcinoma this patient is having healed basal cell carcinoma who has been treated okay when this patient is having cutaneous anomalies like benign dermal cyst and in this patient you can make out bifid ribs are seen and multiple okcs are seen so maybe if you are looking at it you might be able to remember the gorlin gott syndrome i will just put the picture again multiple basal cell carcinomas 
multiple OKCs and bifid ribs. Unfortunately, I forgot to place the picture of multiple nevi. So even multiple nevi are also seen. Okay. So multiple nevi, multiple basal cell carcinomas, multiple OKCs, bifid rib. Even the brain finitions are also seen in Gorlin Gott syndrome. Okay. Thirty fifth. Best. How do we reduce the radiation exposure best of all these four things? Can you make out? Collimation will it be good? Even collimation is good. Decrease the object to film distance. It might help us, but not really cause reduce reduction. Low KVT will in fact cause an increased patient radiation exposure. Decrease target object distance can still be a better answer. So we are left with choice A and D. But of the two, collimator is a better example. Why? Because decrease target object to distance. Will actually not help us. It will help us in a better image reproduction, but the patient radiation exposure will not really be helpful. Is it clear? The choice D is good for telling us about image sharpness, but not about radiation exposure. There will be no effect if we decrease target object film distance. There will be no effect on the patient radiation exposure. But when we place a collimator, it will actually help us in. Patients reduced radiation exposure. Is it clear? Uh, just few quick recap. Well, whether it is a male or female, there is no discrimination in the dose limit except when a female pregnant female is there. Okay, so males and females, no difference in radiation exposure. Either we are students or operators in training. The recommended dose limit for the public apply. And again, equivalent dose is 500 millisieverts. The maximum MPD, maximum permissible dose is 500 millisieverts. Okay, is it clear? Thirty-sixth, the most likely diagnosis of a one centimeter mobile mass in the parotid is well, the word most likely is there. So whenever the word most likely comes, which all the conditions you can think of? Indirectly, what are we asking? We are actually asking you which is the most common parotid gland tumor because all the malignant tumors, remember, are fixed. All the malignant tumors are fixed. So choice A, C, and D are automatically ruled out. So what are we left with? Choice B and E. What if tumor is not as common, but when the word comes most likely, so the correct answer becomes pleomorphic adenoma. So it's again it's <coughs> it's a sort of trick question. <coughs> well, this is how a lump appears to be. This is just I don't think you can be able to make out properly. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you in this, if the patient is having any facial palsy or pain or fixed lymph node, it is malignant. But when it is Asymptomatic, it is mobile. Then it is most likely an example of a benign salivary gland. Okay, is it clear? Should I change? Pleomorphic adenoma. Thirty-seventh. A twelve-year-old boy has a history of severe sore throat followed by migratory arthralgia and swollen joints of extremities. This history is suggestive of. Definitely not A, isn't it? <laughs> so we are left with choices right from B to E: osteoarthritis, chronic polyarthritis, rheumatic fever, rheumatoid arthritis. So what's the answer? It is rheumatic fever. Very good. Why rheumatic fever? Simply because of the fact in rheumatic fever there is a history of severe sore throat followed by migratory arthralgia, and this ultimately leads to its formation. So what is rheumatic heart disease? Well, this is an actually an unfortunate disease occurs in children. A patient, a children will be having 
throat infection but due to this throat infection caused by beta hemolytic streptococcus it causes immunological cross reactivity and this results in distortion of the cardiac valves and ultimately destruction so there is a very famous saying it licks the joint but binds the heart so the joint will be polyarthralgia but the heart changes will be more severe ga is contraindicated in this patient and antibiotic prophylaxis remember of sabe i told you same prophylaxis will be given for these patients okay so uh, one of you had written infection signs well this is what happens in this polyarthritis hota hai carditis hota hai pericarditis and new heart murmur is seen uh, well there is a word called as uh, well in this condition a particular condition occurs in rheumatic fever polyarthritis nodosa polyarthritis nodosa is also coexistently seen with patients with rheumatic fever ठीक है एंड समथिंग कॉल्ड एज स्किन माइग्रेंस आर आल्सो सीन इन दिस ठीक है 38th आ there was a question similar to this but this is different from this this is not the same question overlapping contact remember you had told me incorrect horizontal angulation but what about the other choices so what will be your answer in this the choice 3 is definitely there i can give you a huge hint choice c why not choice uh, this thing why incorrect vertical angulation incorrect vertical angulation will not cause it has to be incorrect horizontal angulation so choices uh, c and d are definitely ruled out so we are left with choice a and b mal alignment of teeth will definitely cause but what we need to know vertical angulation will have absolutely no effect so the correct answer is choice b so the correct answer is choice b okay is it clear to why i am writing b because vertical angulation will not have any effect on the overlapping rather it will be the horizontal angulation is it clear vertical angulation will cause elongation and reduced angulation will cause shortening sorry increased uh, vertical angulation will cause shortening and decreased angulation will cause elongation 39 in assessing the prognosis of a neoplasm the most important feature is very easy metastasis isn't it ulceration size duration will have an effect on the duration but metastasis the moment the word metastasis comes your answer should be metastasis agar ek malignancy mein metastasis ho raha hai the entire treatment gets changed theek hai uh just go through it i am not telling you to write it down but you should just have an idea th primary tumor cannot be assessed t0 no evidence of primary tumor t1 is carcinoma in c2 t uh, sorry tis t1 is tumor 2 t2 is 2 to 4 t3 is greater than 4 is it clear to you stage 0 n is again n1 n2 n3 are different side n0 is no lymph node palpable n1 is It's very tiny lymph node. N two is ipsilateral lymph node. N three is contralateral or bilateral lymph node. So these are the few stages. As long as it is T two N zero N zero, it is stage two. Stage three comes when any stage, but N one comes, it becomes stage three. Moment any T, I mean N three comes, it becomes a stage four. Or any M one comes, it becomes a stage four. Obviously, the prognosis for stage four is the poorest. Okay, is it clear to you? Should we go on to the next? Fortieth, a differential diagnosis for gingival enlargement should include which of the following conditions? No, it is not erythema multiforme. It is monocytic leukemia. Good. Why monocytic leukemia? Simply because 
this is the gingival enlargement monocytic leukemia okay can you make a so these are the certain formed elements i'm not going in detail of this but just go through this neutrophils eosinophils basophils lymphocytes monocytes erythrocytes leukemia is the most common kind of cancer in children remember i asked you evin sarcoma that was of the jaws evin sarcoma is the most common malignancy of the jaws but the most common kind of malignancy if you are asking children it is leukemia okay similarly if i ask you most common malignancy in adults is osteosarcoma okay and most common malignancy in elderly patients is i am not asking you of the jaws i am just asking you most common malignancy in the adults is elderly adults which is the commonest malignancy in elderly adults secondary no secondary is the most common malignancy of the jaws but once you are asked which is the commonest malignancy your answer is multiple myeloma okay the commonest malignancy is multiple myeloma in adult in elderly patients but if you are asked of the jaws the answer becomes secondary okay so leukemia is of various types myeloid lymphoid monocytic type uh just go through this slides i mean just have an idea what is aml acute lymphoid leukemia and aml is acute myeloid leukemia acute leukemia are more common in children generally less than 1 years mein hota hai and leukemia rates are higher for white children as compared to black and generally all is supposed to be more common in children as compared to aml is it clear should i all is the most common form in children and represent 80% aml is the second form of leukemia in children okay aml is diagnosed lesser than 1 year and aml is generally 2 to 6 okay well oral manifestation this is the second point gingival hypertrophy why does gingival hyperplasia occur in these patients it is because of the leukemic infiltrate and what are these leukemic infiltrate called as chloromas these leukemic infiltrates which appear are called as chloromas there is mucosal pallor and all this stuff is seen and radiographically we tend to come across loss of lumina dura resorption of bone alteration in pdl destruction of cancellous bone all these findings are generally seen in patients with this i hope it's clear what are chloroma chloroma by word the word chloroma i mean they are generally present in the uh in uh, diver infiltrate and they are leukemic masses is it clear so the answer is obviously in diver hyperplasia is in fact the most constant feature and it occurs due to mild chronic irritation causing the deposition of leukemic infiltrates 41st the most common cause of trigeminal neuralgia is what do you think it could be the most common cause of trigeminal neuralgia is a b c d what it is c choice c the choices a b and d are may be responsible but if you take into in total all the four the choice c is definitely the much much better well uh, just one slide of trigeminal only don't worry trigeminal neuralgia early it's as you can if you see this uh, arrows properly uh, you can appreciate what's happening in the early stages of trigeminal neuralgia patient is having pain free lot of pain free time matlab he is having just pain 10 to 12 times in a day as trigeminal neuralgia progresses the pain free period the red one keeps on the uh, the blue one the pain free period keeps on reducing and ultimately at the end stage disease the pain free period is completely disappeared so that is why trigeminal neuralgia is one of the most painful conditions ever existing on this earth 
Is that clear? What is the drug of choice of trivalent neuralgia? It is carbazepine. It is. And we need to do complete blood count before giving the patients carbazepine. Please remember this. In a patient with trivalent neuralgia, you have to give the patient carbazepine and you tramazaki is very good. Liver test. Both these are correct. Liver test. Why liver test? Because there is a very huge risk of being enzymes being depleted in this patient. So complete blood count, liver test are generally compulsory. They are not optional. They are compulsory in patients with trigeminal neuralgia. So far, the golden drug is still carbazepine. If a patient responds within 72 hours, he will respond. If he cannot respond within 72 hours, you cannot do it. What is the maximum amount of dosage which can be given for carbazepine? It is 1600 milligrams. The maximum amount of carbazepine which can be given is 1600 milligrams. For the second, <laughs> basal cell carcinoma also called as how does a basal cell carcinoma also called as rodent ulcer? A basal cell carcinoma is also called as a rodent ulcer. So, how does a rodent ulcer metastasize? Well, I had used the word local root. So, it generally will just grow a little bit area, but there will be no metastasis. The correct answer is, as she has correctly written, choice E. It will not normally metastasize. It is very good. In fact, second best malignancy as I told you after Kaposi sarcoma. 42nd, the most common cause of an enlarged mandible is the most common cause of an enlarged mandible. Prognathism, in fact, we are asking you. Yes, it is hereditary. Other choices might have a factor, but if you compare it with heredity, heredity definitely wins hands down. 43. The amount of the tissue damage following the radiation depends on. We have all these four choices, radiation type, radiation dose, radiation dose rate, volume of tissue irradiated. All these factors have a role, definitely. The more severe is the radiation, the more damage would be there. Radiation dose is more, it will definitely cause more amount of damage. Radiation dose rate. What do you mean by the word radiation dose rate? Correct. Radiation dose rate, five milli, if you give 5 grays or if you give 10 grays, there is a massive difference. If a tiny volume is irradiated, it will have more damage. But if the radiation is spread to a large body, the amount of damage would be divided and thus the damage would be less. So the correct answer is choice E. Okay. Uh, the reason why I have put this slide is try to remember the SI unit. A lot of questions are out. Not even questions, you should know basic about this. What is the SI unit of absorbed dose? Gray. SI unit of equivalent dose is sievert. SI unit of affected dose is also sievert. Try to remember the middle three, second, third, and the fourth points at least. Okay? Absorbed dose ke SI unit gray hai. Problem hai ki kahi institutions may be traditional unit of Bharati rag me. So this is why I have deliberately put this slide. Equivalent dose SI unit is Sievert and the traditional unit is REM. Effective dose has got no traditional unit and radioactivity the modern unit is Becquerel and the older unit was Curie where one Becquerel is equal to 2.7 into minus 1. Even if you don't know this there is no problem but try to remember these three things at least. Is it clear? Should I change? So for interviews when you're doing this is the point of this is yes, laser point. Mark yes. Okay, yeah. Okay. Is it clear? Can you make out? So these three are most important. So have you changed them? Have you written it? Should I change it now? 44th, the most likely complication following surgery for a patient with thrombocytopenic purpura would be. So what do you think could be? Can it be angina? Highly unlikely, isn't it? Cytopenic purpura is a reduced platelet level. So the correct answer 
automatically becomes even if you don't look at the recent choices is D hemorrhage. Is it clear? What is idiopathic thrombocytopenia? Try to remember the name Warhoff's disease. Warhoff's disease is another name of ITP. ITP is basically divided into two types, primary and secondary. So the primary type is also called as ITP. It's an autoimmune disorder. Well, as the name suggests, autoimmune. What is an autoimmune disorder? When the antibodies start eating their own platelets, when our body starts refusing or stops differentiating between normal and self, then that is called as autoimmune disorder. So our body will start producing antibodies against its own platelets and this is called as autoimmune disorder. Clinical features, I think all these are very standard for puric and hemorrhagic lesions, epistaxis, bleeding in the urinary tract and GIT. Okay. Oral manifestations, petechia can be seen very well on the oral mucosa. Platelet count, remember any platelet disorder, the bleeding time is prolonged. ठीक है आपका थ्रोमोसाइटोपेनिक पर भी रहा है आपका कोई भी डिजीज है जिसके अंदर आपका प्लेटलेट की प्रॉब्लम है वहां पर ब्लीडिंग टाइम विल आल्सो बी प्रोलॉन्ग ओके सो ब्लीडिंग टाइम विल बी प्रोलॉन्ग इन द पेशेंट्स विथ प्लेटलेट डिसऑर्डर्स फोर्टी फिफ्थ in a factor 8 hemophilia, which of the following laboratory findings is typical? <coughs> Remember, I told you something, bleeding time. Bleeding time has got absolutely no relation with your clotting factor. It has got only relation with platelet disorder. So is hemophilia a problem of platelets? No. So what is it basically it's a disorder of factor A deficiency. Okay? It is prolonged clotting time. Why prolonged clotting time? Simply because I told you it has got nothing to do with platelet. So if the moment I said platelet tone, the choice C gets reduced. As I told you, bleeding time has got only one connection, and that is with the platelet tone. So the moment I tell this, the bleeding time also gets discarded. So we are left with choice A and D. PT is not affected in internal pathway. It is more affected in extrinsic pathway. So prolonged clotting time, which is also called as PTT, is also seen in factor eight hemophilia. Okay, is it clear? Only few slides left only for today's discussion. So just five to ten minutes. Okay. Coagulation disorders. Well, uh, just a very very short review of what happens in this. The clotting cascade initially is the platelets get active. Then the thromboplastin gets activated, resulting in the formation of prothrombin to thrombin to fibrinogen and ultimately fibrin and ultimately there is blood clot. Intrinsic pathway, as I had written PTT, remember bleeding time is indicative of platelets, right? Prothrombin time is indicative of extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway is indicative of PTT. Okay, try to remember this. I will just tell you an example how I remember this very easy. There are less factors in this. Factor 7, only one factor is being involved. And PT has got less alphabets. Okay. And PTT has got more alphabets and more factors. So this is how I have always remembered. Otherwise, it becomes really confusing if you remember it all of a sudden. So just remember intrinsic pathway, lot of factors, lot of alphabets. So it becomes PTT. So PTT is only seen in intrinsic pathway. An extrinsic pathway, less factor, less alphabet, so PT. I hope this really will help you in remembering this. Platelets, it's bleeding time. Common pathway, obviously, then you have to use a little bit of logic. If there is a factor 10 deficiency which will be increased, both PT and both PTT will be increased. Okay? Hemophilia, it's also called as Breeders disease or disease of the Habsburg. It's a sex linked recessive disorder. Type? Well, there are three types A, B, C. Well, we all know about hemophilia A, factor A deficiency. Hemophilia B, 
we also call it as a factor 9 deficiency or we also call it as what is the other name of hemophilia b well the season is coming it's actually christmas disease isn't it it's also called as christmas disease hemophilia b is also called as christmas disease and hemophilia c is your deficiency of factor 11 what is para hemophilia what is para types of hemophilia there are five types actually a is factor 8 b is factor 9 c is factor 11 what is para hemophilia deficiency of which factor it is the deficiency of factor 5 the deficiency of factor 5 is called as para hemophilia and what is vascular hemophilia what is vascular hemophilia is what is vascular hemophilia can anyone of you write me or tell me no it is von willi brand disease vwv von willi brand disease vascular hemophilia is actually von willi brand disease so please do not think there is only one hemophilia there are five types a b c hemophilia a is factor 8 hemophilia b is factor 9 hemophilia c is factor 11 para hemophilia is factor 5 and hemophilia and uh, pseudo hemophilia or vascular hemophilia is factor 5 sorry von willi brand This is what happens. Large hematosis, as you can make out. Uh, classification is depending on the what are the levels. Lesser than one percent becomes severe, and this is how it happens. Spontaneous bleeding will occur when the levels are lesser than one percent. In C, there is absence of the bleeding in the joints and muscles. Oral manifestations. well we have this in dival hemorrhage physiological processes are affected and mandibular pseudo tumor of hemophilia is it clear acchymosis well you can make out this areas reddish areas well as i told you breathing time will be normal pt will be normal ptt will be prolonged right because factor rate comes in intrinsic pathway i told you more factors just remember aptt and ptt is also called as clotting time sometimes so that is why ptt will be prolonged and clotting time will also be 46 what do you think this will be necrotizing ulcerated gingivitis affects mainly the attached gingiva then there will papillae alveolar mucosa buccal mucosa epithelial attachment what necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis generally affects our interdental gingiva theek okay? hai so interdental papillae will be the gingival papillae would be most affected in patients with necu necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis which is also called as anag is also called as trench mouth isn't it trench mouth it's also called as what is vincennes angina vincennes angina what is vincennes angina when acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis involves the pharynx then it is called as vincennes angina please do not confuse it with ludwig's angina Ludwig's angina is completely different from uh, this thing. ठीक है? Vincent's angina is completely different. Forty seventh, papillary hyperplasia under a denture is usually due to what do you think it could be? What is monilyasis? Monilyasis is candidiasis, but the main question is. papillary hyperplasia under denture is also a type of candidiasis but it will occur due to an ill fitting denture so your answer is absolutely correct it will be due to ill fitting denture okay 
so involved in mucosa of the palate and remember i told you uh dentist stomatitis is also called as atrophic candidiasis or chronic atrophic candidiasis so dentist stomatitis well uh, under a generally you will never see it under a lower denture you will always see it under an upper denture isn't it it's also known as kissing lesion remember i told you in the beginning various forms well there are three types type 1 type 2 and type 3 okay this is type 1 localized areas of erythematous areas is type 1 type 2 is diffuse erythematous areas over the palate type 2 okay and type 3 is what you had answered papillary hyperplasia of the palate and the ridges so that is your type 3 Which is the commonest type of these three? It is two. The so type two among all these three types is the commonest. Forty-eight. La. Uh, so what will be this answer? The appearance of a circumscribed radial lucent area, sharply outlined, bounded by an even radio peg area located at the apex of a non-vital tooth, is consistent with. Now, uh, well, the moment the word comes non-vital tooth, it becomes a very easy answer, isn't it? So the correct answer is radicular cyst. Why not periapical cemental dysplasia? Because periapical cemental dysplasia is always present at the apex of a vital tooth. Okay. So the correct answer is choice B, radicular cyst. Uh, just I just want to just tell you what is periapical cemento osseous dysplasia, also called as cementoma. Very low incidence of 0.5 percent, and involves periapical region of the anterior mandible. Affects females, blacks, 30 to 50 years of age group, and generally is multiple. Okay. Periapical cemento osseous dysplasia is generally multiple, occurring in blacks. Interior mandible, in, to be more specific, lower in sizes, females, blacks, middle age age group, and this is how periapical cemental dysplasia will appear as radiographically. What do you think the tooth will be, vital or non-vital? In periapical cemental dysplasia, tooth would be vital. In periapical cemental dysplasia, the tooth would be vital. Good. Whereas in the case of radicular, it will be non-vital. Okay. So this is how periapical cemental dysplasia appears as first as completely radiolucent. Then in this, you can make out there are certain radiopaque areas. So it is a mixed stage, and ultimately it is becoming completely radiopaque, almost like a fibrous dysplasia. Completely radiolucent, intermediate, and then becomes completely radiopaque. Okay, so our correct answer was radicular cyst. So second last question: Direct immunofluorescence seen in Pemphigus vulgaris has been described as. Uh, it's a slightly tough question. No, so normal appearance is generally seen radiographically of immunoblastoma. The correct answer is absolutely right. Chicken wire appearance. Okay. Pemphigus vulgaris. I'll just tell you what is direct immunofluorescence. Don't get scared by seeing the slide. It's actually very easy. So what happens is we have an auto antigen. What do you mean by an auto antigen? By auto antigen, we generally mean that there is some amount of an any antigen which has entered in the blood, and that antigen is then attached with an auto antibody already bound to the tissue. we do a section of frozen tissue and then we add on a fluorescent antibody and then if you see this light probably we view it under ultraviolet light microscopy so if you can see of the slide there you can make you can make out there is lot of disjointed areas in this can you make out so this is an example of pemphigus and in this probably you guys can make out the difference between the two upper and the lower in lower there is just one single immunofluorescent radiolucent line which is just falling like this can you make out i'm just trying to draw the outline this is pemphigoid and this is pemphigus what i am trying to imply is pemphigus vulgaris is intraepithelial and pemphigoid is subepithelial 
Is it clear? Okay. And this is indirect immunofluorescence. Most of the times we guys do direct immunofluorescence. This is indirect immunofluorescence. We just take the blood and on the blood drop of diluted serum and on this we add any antibody not of the patient of any human, any other human or monkey and in according to that we do fluorescent label anti-IgG antibody and we do this scan. So this is again pemphigus vulgaris. Is it clear? So this appearance is similar to a chicken wire. So pemphigus vulgaris uh, just just go through it, no need to really mug it up. The main word which you guys need to know is acantholysis. Okay? Acantholysis is the hallmark of pemphigus vulgaris. This is how pemphigus vulgaris would appear as desquamative gingivitis. Okay? Can you see this bright reddish gingival area? And in this you can see the ulcerations. Erosion, sorry. How is pemphigus different from pemphigoid? There is involvement of eyes in pemphigoid. Okay? Skin involvement is absent, non-fatal. Whereas, you can see this, immunofluorescence, a line is there, and eye involvement. Oral manifestations of pemphigus and pemphigoid are same, but the only difference is in the histopathology or the immunofluorescence, this is how it will appear. So it is sub-epithelial in pemphigoid, whereas in pemphigus it is intra-epithelial. Which antibody is involved in this? Which antibody? It is Ig. Which one? IgA, IgM, Ig, IgD, IgG. Which one? It is G. IgG. Okay. So this is the last question of today's discussion. Laboratory examination of a blood of a patient with an acute bacterial infection would show what? It's actually very easy. Lymphocytosis, leukocytosis, monocytosis, leukopenia or eosinophilia. Eosinophilia, absolutely not. In eosinophilia there is bacterial infection. I'll just tell you This is basophilia. Basophilia, where does basophilia occurs? In infections like smallpox, chickenpox, polycythemia, where are? And splenectomy. Okay? Basophilia occurs in all this condition. Eosinophilia, it occurs in allergic conditions and skin diseases, parasitism, certain infections like scarlet fever. Okay? Neutrophilia occurs in acute infections, focal, fungal, generalized infection, leumatic fever, inflammatory condition, coronary thrombosis, metabolic infections, acute hemorrhage, hemolysis, physiological conditions, poisonings, neutrophilia is occurring in this. Monocytosis is occurring in bacterial infections like TB, SABE, syphilis, lymphoma, leukemia, malignant neoplasm, tetrachloroethane poisoning. And lymphocytosis is also occurring in acute and chronic infections. Okay, so what is your answer then? So what is now your answer? It can it be eosinophilia now? The correct answer obviously is either monocytosis or lymphocytosis. But okay, it has to be leukocytosis. Because WBCs are increased. So of the two, the better answer would be leukocytosis. Okay? Is it clear? Why leukocytosis? WBCs ka jab bar jata hai, to usko hum kate hai leukocytosis. Okay? So this is how a lymphocyte appears as no cytoplasm. Lifespan is of half to one day. Well, T cells and B cells, I could have gone on and on, but the time permits me only this only yes all wbc exactly so if you want you can just write it down if you want lymphocytosis occurring in all these conditions if you want to write it down 
just let me know i will just go a bit slow okay then monocytosis is occurring in uh, just don't write all down i'll just tell you the important one tb and sabe are important in fact sabe they will ask you question protozoal infections <coughs> lymphoma and leukemia just remember this only that's it increased neutrophilia will occur in acute infections generalized infection like rheumatic fever inflammatory condition like burns and poisoning okay acute infection generalized infection inflammatory conditions and poisoning is no filia allergic conditions just remember allergic conditions and parasitism these two are important basophilia very rarely will you see basophilia very very rare if it occurs it's seen in smallpox and chickenpox okay and polycythemia vera of course what is polycythemia vera it is increased rbc is called as polycythemia okay so is it clear any doubts you guys have you can just write it down maybe i can discuss it if you are having any doubt in the entire discussion i mean i have tried to cover as much as possible but three and a half hours i am try to do it as much as possible to cover as much as possible in this if you are having any doubt you can just write it down i can maybe ask uh, i can maybe then discuss that with you okay thanks a lot guys any doubt you can just ask us any time okay so how can we reduce uh, in children the for number one thing how can we <coughs> sorry how can we reduce uh, radiation exposure in children the number one thing is obviously if you remember that slide i had shown you i'll just show you that slide again mm. स्लाइड ऑर्डर कैसे आते हैं इसमें स्लाइड ऑर्डर आता है इसमें हम्म चलो कोई बात नहीं मैं ऐसे बताता हूं सी व्हाट हैपेंस इज इन चिल्ड्रन व्हाट वी डू हियर इन चिल्ड्रन द बेस्ट अमाउंट ऑफ रेडिएशन एक्सपोजर इज बाय यूजिंग डिजिटल रेडियोग्राफी इन फैक्ट इफ यू आर आस्क क्वेश्चंस रिगार्डिंग इन चिल्ड्रन रिमेंबर द वर्ड डिजिटल इमेजिंग इज द नंबर वन थिंग टू रिड्यूस द रेडिएशन एक्सपोजर लाइक आई हैव शोड यू कोलिमेटर फिल्टर red apron barrier everything i have shown you right in addition to all that in children you need to do digital imaging theek okay? hai why digital imaging a digital imaging uh, yes even kvp setting is also there in digital imaging 80% reduced radiation exposure is there in children when you want to take radiograph you need to reduce the kvp you need to reduce the kvp in children to ensure that radiographs can be taken because if we have an increased kvp what will happen is it will cause an extra amount of uh, radiograph to be reaching the film and causing darkening of the image so that is why the kvp setting need to be reduced in children i hope this clears your doubt how much well it really depends on the child if the child is suppose a very bulky child 70 kvp you can just reduce it to 66 64 62 but if the child is really thin then immediately you need to uh, click on the child setting which immediately reduces it to 50 kvp 
okay but it really depends on a lot of factors like if the child is obese and very bulky you have to increase the kvp okay any other doubt please don't feel shy or embarrassed in asking or writing i mean anything else I think this is the slide which I was about to show you. X-ray generation and kilo voltage. I think this is what you would like to ask. You are asking now. Filtration, polymation, choice of image receptor. The word digital receptor is coming over here. This is the one which is important. Lead barrier, lead adapter, third color. Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, what? Okay. So in Hodgkin's lymphoma, you see there are it has four types. It's basically one of the very few diseases which has got. bimodal h incidence bimodal h incidence peak it represents one of the very few condition which has got a bimodal h incidence peak by the word bimodal i mean that the child can uh, bimodal h incidence it will occurring in the second decade and in the 6 to 7 decade okay and wheat sternberg cells are the hallmark of this it is a four types histopathologically Lymphocyte predominant, lymphocyte depleted, mixed cellularity. Of the uh, of the four, the predominant part has got the best prognosis, and the depleted has got the worst prognosis. Okay, and there is a fever called as Pell Epstein type of fever, which is seen in patients with Hodgkin's disease. Okay, Pell Epstein, P E L, sorry. Thyroid colors are still used. Thyroid colors are still used uh, uh, everywhere, but the thing is, thyroid colors are not practically used everywhere. But ideally, they should be used because the thyroid colors actually reduces radiation exposure. And uh, one more thing is, certain lead aprons have come which are reaching right there till neck. I don't know whether you guys can see me or not. Uh, uh, the lead aprons are coming which can cover till over here. So maybe in UK they are using those type of lead aprons. That is why there is no need of thyroid colors. Elsewhere the thyroid colors are till here at the neck lower level neck, but some lead aprons have been start being made which are reaching till the chin, so they might be indirectly be covering up for the thyroid gland. So that is why maybe in UK they are not using it. Is it clear now? Any else? Any else? i hope there is no any confusion or any doubt anything like that then okay okay ye band kaise hai bro